Ladies uh, and gentlemen, colleagues, friends, thank you for participating at this conference. As you are aware, we were, ho were hoping to hold uh, this conference at Coventry University, but because of the situation we are in, unfortunately, we had to keep, uh, have it online. Never mind. That's technology, and let's hope it's going to work for us today. Uh, let me thank, first of all, before I forget, thank the members of the chamber and um, uh, the steering committee, uh, particularly two vice chairs, um, Mr. Peter Maddock and our mayor councillor Susan Rasmussen for their good work. Good morning to you all. Um, and also um, thank uh, colleagues from C4FF. C4FF Center for Factories of the Future has been helping us to organize this conference on behalf of the Coventry and Warwickshire Air Quality People's Chamber. I would like to thank Dr. Lakvia and also for Wendy for doing all the paperwork and whatever. So thank you all. Now, I also, before going any further, would like to tell you that I would like to involve young people and support them to become involved with climate change. We have started a number of projects at local universities. We have got project groups working on air quality. And I want to extend that to engineering institutions locally and at regional and national level. So let me share my um, slides with you. And then we can go and if, there you are. I think I'm doing the right thing. There you are. And I better, enlarge it so you can all see it. Good. So I've already gone through here. And I also like, would like to thank all the participants uh, attending this conference. Now, the choice, ladies and gentlemen, is stark. Carrying on with what we are doing and destroying the world or taking drastic action and leaving a better world for our next generations. That is why we set up these chambers in various places, but the one in uh, Coventry and Warwickshire, uh, People's Chamber is an important one. And uh, we I would also go through a few slides to tell you what the objective of this chamber is. But before doing that, I want to tell you the, a few facts which are important. A human lungs breathes about 13,000 liters. You know what a liter is? 13,000 liters of air a day on a normal pace. Therefore, air quality is a very important factor for human body as oxygen in the air is mixed with the blood in the lungs. Contaminated uh, and harmful air has a direct effect on damaging the respiratory system and eventually the whole body. So that is why the chamber was set up. Now the chamber is an independent body composed of representatives of resident associations, academics, counselors, medical profession, and um, pollution specialists form to gather bona fide data to help all concerned to make the right decision on a way to improve air quality. There is a need for more and more accurate monitoring, which our group can do, and which can be done to use to support the local work by councils and local universities and other research establishments locally, regionally, and nationally. The intention is to, and our desire are to work closely with our own local councils and the government agency to improve the air quality of the towns and cities. What are the aims of the chamber? Is to gain a wider understanding of effects of poor air quality, to understand what we currently measure and consider its adequacy, to communicate the above understanding to the widest possible audience, to share the evidence based on health and social impact of poor air quality, to share good practice, to understand the likely impacts of poor air quality on cities such as Coventry and towns like Leamington Spoor, and be aware that air quality does not differentiate administrative boundaries. To consider possible ways to mitigate against air quality, uh, air, poor air quality, and to agree next steps towards clean air, local air, and helping the government with the climate change emergency initiative. This is a, a very quick diagram of the COVID factor, 2020. This was taken during the March as the lockdown started. The blue line shows the reduced pollution level and the red one would be as it was if there was no lockdown. So lo lockdown had a um, massive impact on the quality of air, so it can be done. But so we have to be aware that uh, we shouldn't just expect a, a COVID-19 
to uh, force us to make changes and we should learn from what we have observed and try to take that into consideration with plan for future air quality initiatives. At the moment, there are no systematic mapping of the pollution hotspot across the uh, area and the non-existence or inaccurate means of measuring harmful pollutants. I will explain that in my let, uh, paper later during the day, but this is the major problem. And what we are trying to support is that our proposal is to set up this independent facility with a technician, and we are not uh, talking about a substantial amount of money so that we can work with local councils to make sure the data and readings from various um, senses around the cities and towns are um, measuring the right thing and that there is no misrepresentation of the data and people are aware of this. People need to know because the reason I become involved, I'm an engine designer. I was the one, I know what the engines produce and the, the only reason I become involved because my neighbor developed lung cancer and another one has developed lung cancer recently. And when I was cycling to my office at Warwick University, I, oh, my bicycle, I will always had a, a slightly bad ch chest on the day. So when I started measuring, I realized, for instance, it's not just a city center. During the rush hour, the area around Coven uh, Warwick University was heavily polluted. Now, what do I want to achieve from this today's meeting is that uh, to, how can we, do what we can to reduce the toxins in the air to the levels that are safe for human consumption. I do know that the government has approved some sort of plan for various cities, including for Coventry. But I don't think that money is enough. The government fund is minuscule to what is actually going to take place. If you look at the government initiative in terms of COVID-19, you can see there has been a huge amount of interactions, development, and money has been spent to counter this. But if you look at the, I give you evidence to show that the uh, impact of the uh, poor air quality is four times as much as COVID on human health. That, and this documentation will be presented during the day, but I'll be showing you one or two slides to warm you up so that the other speakers are aware of what I intend to say later. And the idea is obviously is the, all the local authorities should be encouraged, and they are, our Coventry Council is very helpful, to develop ambitious local climate actions. Although that money has been approved, it's not enough. We want to work with them so that they have more money to do what is right and what the residents of the city deserve. Um, so this event is an opportunity for our chamber to work with our local parliamentary representatives and civic leaders to enhance our representation and voice for a better air quality in our cities and towns. And this is the second conference, as you know, and we hope that this will be, there will be many more conferences like this in the future. The situation in uh, Coventry is bad. We know in terms of performance, the score is 52%. North Warwickshire is not that much better. As I uh, mentioned earlier, lack of measuring known pollution uh, spots is, is a major problem. The focus is on NOx, nitrogen dioxide. Uh, there is a limited particular uh, matters um, measurement that is where the most damage is done. And there is no known measurement of less than particulate matters 2.5, which does huge damage. And this is associated with electrical, uh, electric cars and so on. So electric cars are not always all the solution, but they are part of the solution. The following example uh, of the work we are undertaking show you some of the problem with Coventry in 2000. 15, those red spots is the census registering pollution above the government uh, target. Uh, as you can see in 2016, nothing changed major. Suddenly in 2017, we have got um, such an improved situation. Uh, I want to, by the way, to take my hat off to the city council for doing a lot of good work. But when we look at the reason why they, suddenly there was this improvement in 2017, for instance, we looked at in um, uh, Holly Road Road, the reading was 95%, but that was reduced to uh, by using a bias adjusted factor and analyzing the data to 79. And later on, by looking at the um, distance correction, they reduced it to 62. Even 62 is well above the 40 allowed by the, by the government. So you can see what the people in Holly Road are subjected to. My own reading shows 121. 
And uh, I can tell you that if you, this, you uh, usually these sensors are three meters from the road on average. So if you should, cannot adjust it for distance being away from the road. So if you're actually trying to adjust it, if the sensor is near the road, it's gonna read much, much higher values. So these are the things we have to correct because the citizens need to know. Uh, my own uh, result of a research we conducted at Coventry University, that we, uh, the two devices you can see, the device closer to the street recorded higher pollution level. So if there is any adjustment, you have to increase it, not decrease it. The mortality rates also from respiratory diseases between 2014 and 16 was 43% per 100,000 and for, Covent, uh, for Coventry and 33.8 for, for the England on average. So you can see that Coventry has a major issue and they have tried to solve it. And miss, most of the problems that I know, having measured things going from home to uh, my office, was the trucks, the old buses, the, these vans, diesel vans going around from various places. But that is not to say that normal other form of transport are not, the, which use fossil fuels are not responsible. This is my result of the admission to hospital for respiratory diseases from 2007, 2017. As you can see, it's gradually incre increasing. And if I show you that against the readings, you can see there is a correlation between uh, air quality and admission to the hospital. So there are evidence to show, and we have got a prominent doctor who will be talking to us later. There is evidence that there is a correlation. So the, the people's health is at stake and we have to obviously work with the councils to make sure that the numbers are going to be reduced substantially. Now, I'm gonna go back during my presentation later on and say a few things and my colleagues have got statements to make. So we are gonna do this later. Um, but before doing that, this is very important. The recent calibration, not by me, of the diffusion tubes has found that they were on the recording nitrogen dioxide by 34%. My argument was about 25 to 30, but they have gone even above my numbers. All mapped background NO2 concentrations should be scaled upwards by 34.6% based on the comparison between mapped background concentration and the measured annual mean uh, nitrogen dioxide concentration. Uh, so that was compared, some of these uh, diffusion tubes were compared with the government's own air quality um, uh, monitoring stations. This is the measurement we took from the Binley Road during the lockdown. As you can see, lockdown, the level was 50, almost 50% 50 less. On number of occasion in a week, the levels went well above the uh, targets set by the government. The same thing for Oldsley, for PM10 and PM2.5, and same thing again for, um, for uh, PM10 at Binley again. And that is for Osley for um, NO2. But I will go through that throughout the day, but I wanted you to have a look at this. So when we are having the presentation by other colleagues to indicate that there are real issues that we need to sit down and work together. Uh, this, if we look at each pollutants, the impact of them are is about seven to 8%. So ozone is responsible for 5.7 premature deaths. Now, PM 2.5 is responsible for 7.5. These are not my data. This is the Royal um, uh, uh, Physicians Institute publishing reports and documents. So if you look at this, we are talking about 30, 40%, whereas the impact of COVID is about five to 10%. So we should take air pollution uh, a lot more serious, uh, seriously than COVID-19. Anyway, I don't want to say a great deal, uh, I wish the conference well and hope that the expected outcomes are realized in due course. Just before I finish, there is an evaluation questionnaire which I would like you to complete at the end of the conference. If during the conference you want to raise a question, please press the chat button, not the question and answer. Thank you for your attention. I give the platform now to Anita Dalton to read the messages from the government. Oh, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, so here are some messages that have come in. The Prime Minister's message on the 28th of February. Government recent efforts. Climate Assembly UK. The path to net zero. 
In a letter to Professor Zarati, the Prime Minister, with regards to the advisory and academic panels working towards zero emissions, states that it is testament to your hard work that so many talented individuals and organisations from across the UK are involved. As the UK's first Citizens' Assembly on Climate Change met for the first time at the end of January, the two panels of stakeholders and researchers helping to ensure the balance and accuracy of the Assembly have been announced. Then there is a message, there's a two-page letter, it has been reduced for your benefit. The Department for Environmental Food and Rural Affairs, Rebecca Powell, MP, Under Secretary of State, 31st of January 2020. The Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, Rebecca Powell, MP, Under Secretary of State, has written to Professor Sarati reporting on the Government Road to Zero strategy, which is an approach to reduce emissions of road vehicles. It is reassuring to read that DEFRA has identified mechanisms such as a multi day air quality forecast service and daily air quality index to advise the public of strategies to support any potential health concerns potentially related to air quality. The Minister stated that government is committed to making sure the best evidence and information is available to the public. As the result of the Minister's letter to Professor Zarati, several contacts were made with Coventry City Council. The discussions are ongoing. A report on the progress of getting data from the two stations which measure PMs is expected to be presented at the CWAQPC conference in July 2020 at Coventry University. The Right Honourable Jeremy Wright, uh, MP, 9th of June, 220. Mr Wright has asked me to thank you for your kind invitation to the Air Quality Conference 220. Unfortunately, due to diary commitments, he is unable to attend, but he does hope that the conference goes well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anita. I want now to introduce you to uh, our very good MP, the, um, Mr. Matt Weston, to give the first keynote speech. Good morning to you, MP. Good morning, uh, and thank you very much for the warm invitation. Thanks for the invitation, full stop, uh, and those kind words. Um, I, I hope I can live up to them. Um, in actual fact, I, I was... Uh, Last night, I was just walking down uh, the street, decided to, having come back late from London, just to go for a walk uh, in Leamington. And as we were walking down the street, there was this, I heard this noise behind us, clearly a, a noisy, slightly souped up vehicle uh, behind. And anyway, it passed by making its noise. But as we continued to walk down the street, uh, I couldn't help but take in these fumes from the vehicle. And it wasn't just a passing thing, it was something that continued for a good hundred meters. And it made me think really just about this very hidden uh, risk, this, this hidden pollution that we, that we face. And, and just how over the last couple of months really with, with lockdown, how we've got used to so much better quality air and it's the thing that perhaps uh, a great number of people have commented to me, other than the lack of aeroplanes uh, uh, in the skies above, uh, that it's been the air quality that has been uh, one of the great uh, beneficiaries, really, of, of the lockdown. Uh, I used to live in central London in the uh, 1990s, uh, just 20 meters from a, a major roundabout. And... In those days, you know, you'd get, you'd, I'd come home from work and I'd blow my nose or whatever, and you just look, it was disgusting. And we have come a long way from, from those days, for sure. Uh, and that's, you know, that progress is, is to be commended. But of course, it's very, uh, very clear that we have a, a huge challenge on our hands. And as you've been uh, articulating, a, a, a considerable cost uh, to, uh, to human health. And when you look at uh, the, the report from the Royal College of Physicians, estimating that there have been 40,000 early deaths every year attributable to air pollution, and you put that in the context of uh, COVID-19, uh, you realize just uh, how important this is and what a priority uh, government should be uh, giving it. 
And one of the other concerns, of course, is just the impact it has on children disproportionately affected uh, by uh, polluted air. And that the research of the World Health Organization uh, showing just how uniquely damaging it is, uh, impacting on low birth weight and poor neurodevelopment. Now, this is a concern for all of us, Coventry, Warwickshire, worldwide. But uh, in Warwick and Leamington, we have two of the most polluted areas in the UK, according to the World Health Organization. Leamington is actually the 31st uh, most polluted. And uh, that is why I've been speaking out about it in Parliament, uh, because we have to do something. And uh, as evidenced by the recent improvement in air quality, things can be done. It is just about the wit and the will, really, of those of us in elected positions and those with budgets and power to actually affect them. You know, there are something like just under 30,000 children in Warwick District with unsafe levels of air pollution. And, you know, if that wasn't just bad enough, you look at the impacts of the coronavirus and we see how we're being affected in other ways. The preliminary work in in England is showing that uh, air pollution has an effect on COVID-19 infection and of course uh, on death rates. Now we've seen a lot more people working from home. Now that's on one way, on one level, a very positive thing, uh, reducing the amount of uh, travel. Uh, of course there are other consequences of home working which we shouldn't uh, forget uh, uh, as well, but, but there are some, are some positives. Now, when it comes to air pollution, of course, over the decades, industrial uh, use power was a major contributor, but it is predominantly now transport uh, that we have to focus on and where the huge opportunity, whether it be road traffic uh, or trains. And I think often about Chiltern Line being a diesel uh, route and, and how much better it could be. When I arrived down in Marlebone, uh, the, the track just backs onto a primary school right in Marlebone itself. And you think about the fumes right by that primary school, how that should be permissible. But of course, presently uh, it is. Now, uh, you'll appreciate that with road vehicular traffic contributes about a third of nitrogen oxide uh, emissions. And that levels have actually remained flat uh, since uh, 2011, despite stricter emission standards on all vehicles. Now, next week, we know that the, the Chancellor is expected to make some sort of statement. Uh, and I very much hope that the Chancellor will use that opportunity to change behaviors and encourage uh, people to think about how they move in our urban areas. Back in 2008, 2009, of course, we had the financial crisis. And the then Labour government introduced a scrappage scheme to get the older vehicles off the road. Now that was very successful. It's a, it was a policy adopted in other countries and that's being run actually in other countries uh, right now in response to the economic uh, crisis uh, resulting from uh, COVID-19. Uh, back in 2009, it was a 2000 pound um, uh, support given to, to, to motorists and they, they upgraded and got cleaner vehicles. And that had a significant uh, impact uh, on the, uh, the air quality um, subsequently. Uh, but my concern is uh, reading reports in the last few days, such as in the, the Times newspaper, uh, that the government uh, seems to be, uh, seems to have very cold feet, uh, reporting that the, the scrappage scheme uh, for petrol and diesel uh, appears to be being ruled out by the government. Uh, I hope that's not the case. There, there is a terrific opportunity, as I say, to put money into cleaner vehicles, and particularly, of course, into encouraging people to switch to uh, electric or hybrid vehicles as well. That's what Norway has done. We know uh, how, cl how class leading the Norwegian government has been in this particular area, not just giving subsidies, but also helping in all sorts of indirect ways to make it a much more attractive proposition to, to go to a, a cleaner vehicle. But we have to look at, and, and, and Red, so you, you were talking about um, uh, heavy goods vehicles and in Coventry and so on. And there is a huge opportunity for the UK to take leadership with the development of hydrogen uh, technologies. Uh, and, and I believe Warwick Manufacturing Group uh, um, should be taking a, a leadership on that, not just in the EV development, which of course it's doing so well on, uh, 
Uh, but I think hydrogen is critically important for HGV and uh, large passenger uh, transport. Again, looking abroad, Germany has committed 9 billion pound, uh, euros rather, uh, to its hydrogen strategy. And Portugal, little Portugal, uh, a fraction of our population, they have a 7 billion pound uh, plan that they've invested. And of course, the EU is also creating an, uh, its own hydrogen strategy, including plans for a multi-billion euro investment in all sorts of hydrogen projects uh, to, to boost sales of hydrogen stroke electric vehicles. I also just want to, if you'll forgive me, highlight the environment bill. The bill really does need clear enforceable targets with specific deadlines. And I'm afraid it only includes a commitment presently for PM 2.5. I think it also needs an independent agency to enforce these, these objectives. It needs to be levying fines on the government as we should be on CO2 um, uh, targets when those uh, limits are, are broken. And, you know, these sorts of fines uh, challenged to the government could be paid towards the NHS because of course it's a subsequent cost to our health service. One of the most crucial things, and I think you were talking about this Ritz, is, is, is really about measuring air quality. And I think publicizing it is vitally important. We're all the same. You, know, you think back to just the impact of the, uh, the smoking ads, looking at pictures of, of lungs, and just how that changed and had such an impact on the behavior of smokers. I think we need to make people think of what is happening in our streets by the hour. Um, I was struck when I, was, I went to Morocco, you'll forgive me, I took an airplane a couple of years ago, uh, but went to Morocco and, and in the streets of Morocco, they actually had numbers showing how much energy had been generated through its solar farms around uh, Marrakesh. Really impressive. This is Morocco doing this kind of thing. Why can't we be doing that in our town centers, getting people to think about the impacts we're all having on one another in our, our town centers? And one of the things I, I've actually raised in parliament was, uh, I think as a scheme maybe in, in New York, where all their refuse lorries have these monitors attached. And so every day, going down every street uh, once a week, you get an update on the, uh, the pollution level from that particular street. And that that information is then fed back to uh, the residents in their particular street. It's a very simple, very low cost way of doing it rather than having say permanent devices all the time. Uh, and you get into every street. And I think that would be a great thing for us to initiate. One of the other things I just want to raise is I'm doing a lot of work on um, active travel. I'm on the AP, or vice chair of the All Party Parliamentary Group for Cycling and Walking. I don't just talk about this stuff, I do it. I'm almost uh, cycling almost exclusively now to Parliament uh, from here in Leamington, getting off the train in Marlebone and going down to Parliament on my bike. But I think we need to invest much more heavily in cycling and pedestrian infrastructure. So I welcome what the Transport Secretary announced uh, a few weeks ago, the two billion pounds investment. Uh, it's very welcome, but I think we need much, much more money. You know, in Warwickshire, we're spending just like 88 pence per person on, on cycling infrastructure. That's not enough. And if I may say, it's uh, something that we as a party, Labour, is committed to investing 10 pounds per person on cycling and walking. That's the sort of investment we see on the continent, and that's what we need to do as well. Just finally, if I may, uh, I'm now using an electric bike uh, and uh, this is the sort of thing that other governments have got behind, giving uh, grants of 250 euros or 500 euros, depending upon the country, to get the uptake. And it has been phenomenal. You know, in, in Germany, uh, they, have, they have purchased something like uh, 10 times, sorry, 20 times the number of bikes, electric bikes in, in Germany because of the grant system. Um, and that's what we need to be thinking about doing. Um, finally, if I may just say, our manifesto is to introduce a Clean Air Act. Uh, we want to see a vehicle scrappage scheme and we want to see clean air zones in all towns uh, and cities complying with the World Health Organization limits uh, for particles and nitrous oxides. I really hope, if I may just say in, in, in closing, that next week is a huge opportunity. Out of this crisis, we need to reset our economy and our communities. If I may say, that was perhaps where the Labour government 
had a chance back in 2009 and didn't. Uh, now is the time, I hope next week, the Chancellor will, will, will grasp the nettle and put in place the sorts of uh, fiscal uh, incentives and stimuli to the economy to bring about these changes. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Weston, for your presentation. Um, I have learned a great deal from about you and how you go about cycling and um, uh, trying to uh, help the communities to improve their um, air quality and so on. So you are a role model for us. I'm not a politician, by the way. None of my students ever knew <laughs> whether I'm Labour, <laughs> Conservative or whatever. As an educationalist and as an educator, I always thought I, I have to stay in the middle. But thank you very much. Uh, your, yeah, it was very impressive. Thank you. Now, the next speaker cannot be at the moment with us. So I was going to ask um, Councillor Matty Haven to make her presentation. Are you ready to do so, Matty? <laughs> you, ha you have to switch your... Uh, yes, that's it. Yes. Yes. Sorry, I was muted. Yes, I'm ready. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be speaking here today to share some of my experience on the serious issue of poor air quality and clean air. My name is Matty Heaven. I'm a Conservative councillor in Coventry, representing Wayne Body Ward. First, I want to thank Professor Zioretti and C4 FF for organizing and hosting this event. It is definitely an issue that affects every individual in their lives and the world would be in a different place if we were all educated on the importance of air quality and the impact it has on our health and life. Looking at the fantastic speakers here on the panel today who will cover different aspects of this issue, I will use my time to focus on one particular area which is close to my heart and uh, which is very important to many residents that I have spoken to locally. So we know that Coventry is one of the 31 cities in UK which exceeds the air pollution limit as outlined by the World Health Organization. There are many factors that contribute to this, but one of the main ones at least on a local level, is during school drop-off and pick-up times. This is an area that I'm very concerned about and I want to highlight it in today's meeting. In my capacity as a councillor and a shadow cabinet member for city services, I have spent a lot of time speaking with residents, parents, teachers and head teachers from various schools and the bottom line is this, there is simply too much pollution surrounding each school during pickup and drop off times, not to mention the traffic and the dangers that it poses to children and the surrounding residents. So um, we all know how the lockdown restriction imposed by the government due to coronavirus have had some positive impact on the air quality. It shows that fewer cars on the street and more people choosing to cycle and walk short distances makes a huge difference. And of course, this is not limited just to Coventry. It has the potential to be implemented nationally and globally and its benefit extends far beyond just clean air. For example, in countries where most people chose to cycle and walk, such as the Philippines, the spread of, the spread of COVID-19 was significant, significantly lower, as multiple people are not confined to small areas, such as cars or buses, and instead travel alone on bikes in the fresh <laughs> air drastically reducing the R value and contributing greatly on reducing the spread of the virus. So right now we live in an era which everything is just rush, 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 and it's a habit that is deeply ingrained in our culture. And I am guilty of that too. Things like taking our time to walk children to school is slowly becoming a thing of the past. 
it sounds trivial, but it's practice such a small shift in our habits, habits will contribute greatly. Projects like the International Walk to School Month, where parents and students are encouraged to walk to school for a week is definitely a step forward, but it's just not enough. Or even measures to close certain roads for a day during a drop off or a pick up hours to limit cars and encourage walking and cycling. So we need to take these steps further towards encouraging a change of lifestyle for parents, which will build the foundations for their children to want to continue this type of lifestyle. It is a matter of a gradual education and accepting that this is a social responsibility. Again, the benefit extends far beyond cleaner air. Most primary schools, if you know, the journey are less than two miles away. Walking to and from school and learning to take our time to do so this way has a huge impact on our mental and physical health benefits and, it, and, and it, the benefits is just much beyond my own comprehension. So um, we see that air pollution during a one hour period that children are dropped off and picked up is up to three times higher. And this is by studies that have been stated. And studies show that it's nearly three quarters of UK towns and cities, children are breathing unsafe level of air pollution. Parents dropping off or picking up their kids are leaving the car engines running during the entire waiting period. Teachers are constantly telling me that this, during this one hour, they suffer due to their breathing problems like asthma. So residents living around the school tell me that between eight to 9 a.m., they cannot open their windows or front door because of the amount of pollution. They are worried about the fumes getting into the house. Additionally, parents increasingly concerned about the safety of their children going to school and back as everyone is so rushed in that one hour, accidents are bound to happen. I've had numerous meetings with head teachers about this very issue where children were almost run over during drop off times. So I appreciate that we cannot totally uh, ban dropping off and picking up children, but we need to implement some drastic measures and we need to implement these fast to help to reduce the many risks that come with this issue. One of the main things that are spoken about a lot is the implementation of infrastructure for cycling routes and pedestrians to feel safe to walk or to bike to school and back. Another way is to help is to encourage schools and parents to implement car sharing. This is after once we pass this period of COVID-19 so that the number of people are dropped off in one vehicle and would help the reduce our pollution. So uh, to just want to conclude that I want to end this with this sobering point that if parents knew if and were educated the impact that this huge problem on the health of their own children and the way they would certainly that they would act much faster if they were all aware of the impact that it has and just uh, following what Matt Weston said uh, if we were all daily updated with the um, level of air pollution and educate ourselves, it would definitely have an impact on our, our behavior and the way we change the way of doing things. So this is why I feel we really crucially need awareness and education on this matter more than ever before and to get together with urgent measures and act actions. And I think it's amazing to have a, events like this. Um, it's crucial to come together and put ideas forward to make some changes and highlight the importance of this. So I really thank you for your time. Thank you. If you've got any questions, let me know. Thank, thank you very much, Councillor 
heaven. Um, is, I mean, amazing when you look at the point of view of a conservative to labor, there are so many similarities when it comes to climate action and um, uh, air quality. Thank you very much for your presentation. If there are, by the way, there are going to be a lot of questions and chats. We are going to collect this, and there is a young lady by the name of, by the name of Mone. She's going to collect this, and then we are going to have a panel discussion in the afternoon. But if there are any questions, we will post it to you. But if there is any urgent question, if anybody, you can uh, uh, please send it to us. We pick this up and we make sure that it uh, is directed to the right person to respond. Uh, so we are going to have a collective questions at the end. Then at least everybody has an opportunity to hear everyone and then raise questions if they wish. Now, um, and I, I want to... I want to give the platform now to Susan Rasmus, and I tell you the reason why. Because our Lord Mayor, Anne Lucas, uh, she has to leave early. So she has asked if she can make a presentation earlier than um, planned. So if you could start introducing her, then she can make her presentation, and then we could say, uh, we could thank her and let her go. Susan, you have to unmute your. Could you unmute, please? We can't hear you. Ah, bravo. Razor, I'm not entirely clear what you want me to say. Uh, it's just that you're chairing the session. You yes, yourself are going to make a presentation. But if you could introduce Anne Lucas, our Lord Mayor, yes. and so she could uh, present, uh, uh, she can uh, speak now, and then we could go back to the program, and hopefully others can make their presentations as we go along. Sorry, I, I, I've got it now. Uh, well, as somebody else with a chain, I'm very delighted to welcome Anne Lucas. I know that in Coventry, there are a set of problems and challenges which are different from the ones we experience in Leamington, but I'm really looking forward to hearing about your perspective from Coventry. Thank you. Do we have um, Anne Lucas? Has she joined the conference because she wanted to speak earlier? Is she there? If you are there, you have to unmute. Otherwise, we won't be able to hear you. No? Oh. Maybe uh, rather than waiting then, Maybe, Susan, you can make your case as the mayor of Leamington. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Why don't I? Um, <laughs> as many of you probably know, being mayor is a non-political position. I'm technically the first citizen of Royal Leamington Spa, but I am, however, very active in groups and campaigns working for Cleaner Air, and I was one of the founder members of Clean Air for Leamington. Um, both Razor and Matt have already drawn attention to the um, similarity in the figures between the 40,000 that we know died prematurely every year from the effects of air pollution and the little over 40,000 which is currently the death toll from the COVID-19 crisis and I, I did hesitate about making that comparison but I, I'm glad they've, they've broached that subject but it's it, it, it uh, it has been a hidden public health emergency. And this time a year ago, our public health expert was telling us, just remember that we can only say air pollution is associated with all these deaths and all the multitude of harms that we all know occur. But this year, things have moved on and we are now understanding increasingly the causal mechanisms that produce the, the early deaths and the, uh, and, and, and the health disadvantages. And like so many other situations, it is the most disadvantaged among us who are the most adversely affected by these uh, polluted air conditions. Well, there is a growing awareness and support for the changes that we need to make. And in Leamington, we know this change is occurring because during three years of consultation for our neighbourhood plan, in the transport section, the first object objective was 
to reduce vehicle emissions, improve air quality, and increase access to and use of sustainable transport modes. In Warwick District, transport is the main source of air pollution. And people get it. And the number one priority when we ask them on street corners, in leisure centres, in the library, at fairs and festivals, the number one priority response that we got was the need to increase the network and facilities to support increased use of bicycling. And the town council has got that message. The district council has also got the message as well. And in a while, we'll be hearing from Alan Reed and Dave Barber, who are leading Warwick District's council's ambitious but achievable target of having a district-wide zero carbon economy by 2030. And the district has called on Warwick County Council to join them in creating a sustainable transport policy. And to my surprise and joy, in March, the government issued their decarbonising transport paper and followed it up on May the 9th with statutory guidance to local authorities. And in both those documents, the Secretary of State for Transport makes it absolutely clear that we need to revolutionise the way that we travel to and move around our towns. Now, that is the strap line for clean air for Leamington. And here is the Secretary of State telling us that he wants us to do it. So the people on the street want change and they know what we need to do to achieve it. And the government is saying the same. But I have to say there's a worrying silence from Warwickshire County Council who are our relevant transport authority. And Last week, someone described them as being institutionally motorist. And in a way, they can't be blamed because in this area, we've made our livelihoods and a few people have made their fortunes from the motor industry. And it's really difficult to go completely across the grain of that heritage. But it does have the unfortunate result of skewing where the budgets and the power resides. For example, for every one person killed or injured on our roads in a road traffic accident, there are 20 who die early or are affected by air pollution. And yet there's a department of road safety working on cambers and road junctions focused on the road traffic aspect. And, and there's, there's no similar structure or budget focusing on what is a 20 times bigger problem. So there is a river trying to get past this boulder, if you like. And uh, the river is a coalition of the sort of people we're, we're talking with today. Politicians, local and national researchers, um, campaign groups, transport experts, and there is a force to the flow, and we're all part of it. So people ask, what can we do? What do we want? And, and, and here's a few things, just from the point of view of Leamington. We want bringing forward urgently the changes that the government is actually directing local authorities to make possible for us. We want those changes to our streets, to our public transport, to our highways. We need to decrease the volume of traffic and increase active and non-polluting modes of public transport, both in and to our towns. And we need to start learning and looking around better. We need to look across the UK and we need to look worldwide. Here's a large scale example, the recent report from the, the Committee on Climate Change scarcely mentions what's happening in other countries. And I would have thought if there's any, any problem that is global, it is the problem of climate change. And they are just really imagining they can reinvent the wheel. And on a very small scale, here's um, uh, a, a, an example. We recently had the parade in Leamington closed, which is our main shopping thoroughfare. Now, it's a 20-year-old plan 
that was developed and put in place by somebody at Warwickshire County Council and we're very grateful that it's happened because it's the first chink in a wall that we can insert a lever in to get more change. But this plan is 20 years old and it was put in place by a road safety expert and there was available, there was engagement with an expert who works in the field of sustainable transport, both design and delivery, who could have shown, in fact did show, what is current best practice, what can work, what is working elsewhere. But having made that small criticism, I would just reinforce the fact we are really grateful that some change has happened and we can use that to build on. So the third thing we need to do, and that's been talked about by Councillor Heaven, and thank you, we need to change culture and behaviours. And we need to capture the positives that have come out of COVID-19. We've talked about the air, and we've talked about the increase in active modes of, of, of transport. So harnessing the younger generation is really a very powerful force. They're much more open to new ideas. And um, I'm, I'm just very excited already to hear that uh, Councillor Heaven is uh, talking about the school run, which is just such a huge part of the problem. Um, what am I doing as mayor? What am I doing? Well, I've got a friend called John Gray, who is now leading Clean Air Warwick. And he says, when you've got a big problem, it's like an elephant. And I'm not usually an advocate of eating endangered species. But if you've got a big elephant, you've got to take it one bite at a time. So here are my small bites as mayor. Firstly, I have the power to convene and to network so that other people who are experts or have the power to make change can get together. And secondly, I have the power to be heard. And it's amazing the amplifying uh, qualities. We've got a sound engineer with us. But the amplifying qualities of a chain around the neck on the human voice are terrific. So I'm hoping to make every use of that that I can. And thirdly, I, I'm acting as I want others to act. And we all have to make small changes in our everyday life. And um, when I made my acceptance speech as mayor, I said I will approach every occasion with as much dignity and joy as I can. And I think in the future, I'm going to be literally approaching each occasion with much joy because I've been offered the use of a sponsored bike, a sponsored electric bike, which has pink zebra stripes on it. And I'm going to be showing the people of Leamington that the mayor can arrive dignified and joyful by bike. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you very much, uh, Susan, for your presentation. You're also a role model for me. You, you practice what you preach, exactly like uh, our very good MP, Mr. Matt Weston. It's good to have role models. And I know Matt is a young lady, and, but I heard what she said. I was very impressed. I have, uh, I have hopes for the future, but I still don't know whether we have um, Mr. Uh, the Lord Mayor Anne Lucas with us. Uh, is Anne Lucas... Uh, attending is she I can see uh, Roshna Sumal uh, uh, can we ask her to see whether the Lord Mayor is ready uh, hi Professor Lakvir uh, we got apologies um, uh, from <laughs> Anne Lucas we just received a message uh, on a chat box from Roshan yes okay so in that case then do we have the Mr. Neil Murphy is he, has he managed to join? Because I know they had difficulties joining the session. Uh, is Mr. Neil Moore, Murphy, the mayor of Warwick here with us? No, um, do we have Richard Dixon, the mayor of Kenilworth? There are, there are problems with the joining the meeting. I don't know exactly what the problem is. Um, but is there anyone else from the, maybe these mayors will join us later on. <laughs> so 
Well, there are issues um, um, in academia we are familiar with. Um, uh, Hi, Prof. Uh, sorry to uh, uh, interrupt. Uh, Jess uh, Richard uh, Dixon is here. Uh, I have promoted him to a panelist. Richard, could you please unmute your microphone? You should be able to speak. Uh, you, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you very much. Uh, and, and thank you, um, uh, Professor Zirati, for organizing uh, today's event. Uh, I'm not quite sure where uh, you are based, Professor, but as the sign says behind me, uh, you are welcome uh, to Kenilworth. Uh, I, I speak Kenilworth. As, uh, I speak as mayor of, of, of the town. Um, I want to talk about four things, uh, if I may, very briefly. First of all, what we're doing uh, in the town centre, what we're doing uh, on uh, our new developments in the town. I also want to talk briefly about alternative forms of transport uh, and also um, some points about uh, limited resources, uh, because I don't think we should fool ourselves that we have um, no uh, constraints uh, upon us. Uh, in the town centre, uh, it, it, it was actually yours truly who first uh, drew the council's attention uh, to the problems of air quality uh, back in 2017 uh, and sought to, first of all, make people aware of the air quality uh, data that did exist uh, at that time produced on an annual basis uh, about uh, problems of air quality. We have um, two particular sites in the town which I'm sure even people from Coventry will know, uh, along Warwick Road, which is the main shopping road uh, in Kenilworth, uh, and also on New Street, which uh, is where most people come into Kenilworth from the northeast uh, by uh, the Virgins and Castle Pub. Uh, and the air quality monitoring data there in both those two places has been, although thankfully in the most recent data, was coming below uh, the uh, 40 uh, limit, uh, but we certainly have had problems there. We also have a, a problem uh, in Kenilworth because our level of car ownership amongst the residents uh, is massively above the national average. I think even based on the 2011 census, uh, we had 17% more households having two or more cars uh, in Kenilworth and you only have to wander around particularly at the weekends and look on the drives and you see three sometimes four cars uh, parked on the drive uh, and they're not uh, small vehicles. Uh, we also have a problem in Kenilworth with a lot of through traffic uh, that comes through the town up the main Warwick Road, um, Mount Abbey Fields uh, and trying to reduce that uh, is one of the town council's uh, priorities uh, over the next 12 months. Uh, I was interested to hear uh, from Councillor Rasmussen uh, the welcome changes in Lamington and we are just in the process of uh, introducing uh, changes in Kenilworth. In fact even this morning although I have to say it did come as a surprise but it was done overnight. Thank you County Council. Uh, we have now blocked off uh, one of the roads uh, in the middle of Kenilworth Station Road uh, and uh, we will be looking to introduce a temporary 20 mile an hour speed limit down Warwick Road which will help uh, improve uh, air quality there. That's what we're doing in the town centre. But the new developments are significant to us because Kenilworth will be building somewhere in the region of 2,000 houses on its uh, eastern side um, and when the neighbourhood plan was uh, put in place uh, and almost unanimously uh, voted upon uh, by residents, um, we had some very uh, uh, tight uh, air quality uh, proposals within that. First of all, that on the development sites uh, on the eastern side of Kenilworth, uh, there will be a 20 mile an hour uh, speed limit put in place there. There will be um, a, a, a huge uh, bond, um, a soil mound essentially, to uh, reduce both uh, pollution uh, and uh, noise pollution uh, from the A46 that travels just up the side. And also making sure that the new schools, both secondary and primary that are built, are located as far away as possible 
from the uh, polluting traffic of uh, the A46. And that was also written into the site development brief so that the developers uh, have to take account of that. <coughs> uh, whether all this gets implemented, of course, depends upon what ultimately gets presented to the planning committee. Um, alternative forms of transport. Uh, we were fortunate uh, back in April 2018 to have our new £14 million pound station uh, open. Uh, and that has, uh, whilst it's not been without its problems, it was first of all 18 months late in opening, uh, and we have had service problems as well with West Midland Railways. It has meant that a lot more people are now using the train uh, to get to Coventry uh, and even now uh, to Nuneaton. Uh, that was the case before uh, and students going to King Henry School, for example, in Coventry can now use the train to do that. Having a regular service is absolutely vital so that people uh, can rely on that. And we had problems with that uh, just before and just after Christmas uh, last year. So there's um, a lot that uh, can still be done to encourage people to come uh, by train uh, to Canterworth uh, to visit uh, and for work. Uh, we also uh, are doing a lot on uh, uh, to encourage people on bikes uh, in Canterworth. We're very proud that for the last three years, I think we've had the um, national cycle race uh, come through the town. And if car ownership is very high, uh, I know from the local bike shop, <coughs> that bike ownership is also uh, incredibly high uh, in the town. Uh, and I'm at the town council because we have now set up a cycling strategy working group is to try to encourage uh, more uh, facilities for people uh, on bikes uh, to make it safe for people to cycle. There are particular uh, areas that we're looking at, uh, not just the new developments, but also the Canterworth to Leamington cycle route. Uh, which hopefully won't get delayed so that people can cycle uh, through Chesterford uh, to Leamington uh, and back and also resolving the long outstanding issue of cycling in Abbey Fields uh, in Kenilworth so that that can be made safe both for cyclists uh, and for non-cyclists, walkers and people with dogs. Uh, I also want to uh, give a shout out <coughs> to the people who set up uh, our first a school cycle bus uh, in Canaworth, which was set up uh, just at the start of this year, every Friday morning, uh, some parents uh, and uh, primary school children travel from the south side of Canaworth uh, to the north side uh, to St Augustine School. I think Adam Tranter, who uh, he and his wife helped set this up together with some others, uh, will be speaking later. But that's a real development uh, and has been much loved. Uh, so trying to get the cycle routes uh, will help improve uh, air quality uh, as well. But we do have to acknowledge in all this <coughs> that we have limited resources. Uh, the Town Council has a limited budget, although it is doing what it can do uh, on cycling matters, uh, particularly with signage uh, and cycle racks. Um, we also have um, plans that we're looking at uh, to possibly include school streets, uh, and what are called parklets, so that to make the experience for pedestrians uh, better uh, in the middle uh, of town. We very much think that whilst we may have limited resources in people at the council, we can work with other local groups uh, to do that. I would give a shout out to the cyclist groups that exist within the town and also the Canterworth Altogether Greener Group. I think there is a danger sometimes we try to impose whatever political party we're from um, solutions on people. I think it's much better if we can work with people and nudge people into changing uh, their behaviour. I think in terms of resources also, we have to acknowledge that we still have a data deficit. It frustrates me that it takes such a long time to get uh, data of air quality uh, out to people. Uh, it was the case that we were waiting 12 months uh, to get uh, data uh, air quality figures uh, intensely frustrating. It's also disappointing that next year's census uh, does not include a, a question about uh, bike ownership. It does interestingly include a question about car ownership. It seems to me perhaps we might have uh, our priorities uh, slightly wrong uh, on that one. I do take uh, 
on board what uh, Councillor Asmussen was saying about practicing what we preach. I do have a bicycle, it's not an electric one. I, I guess because I live in the middle of the town, when I'm doing mayoral duties, I can generally walk everywhere. I do think very much we should practice what we preach. And in that regard, uh, there is no mayoral car uh, budget this year in Kenilworth whatsoever. <laughs> wow. that, that's all I wanted to say. But thank you very much indeed, um, uh, Mr. Richard Dixon. By the way, you are in the, in the, people don't realize, um, uh, although I work, uh, I, I retired five years ago and I set up my offices, my own personal offices and the coordinating team for Center for Factories of the Future. This is a very old European project. It's been going on for some time and the government has been supporting it. So for five years now, I've got my offices where Berkeley House by the clock tower. So, and because we had some extra other offices, other businesses have joined us. So just to let you know, Mr. Dixon, we are nearby. We should get together and have a coffee. We, we uh, meet up for a coffee yeah, when yeah. we can. Yeah. And it's impressive for a small town, how active you are. Thank you very much. Um, now, I noticed that Mayor Neil Murphy is with us, so maybe we should give the platform to him. Um, good morning, Mr. Murphy. The platform is yours. Good, good morning, and uh, I do apologize. I've had very much difficulty joining you this morning, but I have heard everything, I just couldn't get views. But anyway, we're here. And uh, I've been very interested in the Mayor Leamington and the Mayor of Kenilworth. And uh, they, I love their positivity. And again, the good input from Mr. Weston. It is all positive. And we've just got to join it up. Now, I'm the Mayor of Warwick. And I've had a year of this. And I've been very, very lucky to, uh, unfortunately, not achieve really anything, <laughs> to be perfectly frank. But it's not from the lack of trying. And this is possibly where we have to go forward. We have to go forward. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's a pleasure to be here, and I am so proud that I've been able to talk to you today. Possibly not the best uh, positive outcome, but hey. But during the corona, uh, COVID virus, yeah, we must have actually noticed, as we locked down, how nature has unlocked. When we've had our hours exercise, that we see foxes in the street. We see the blackbirds having a go at us, yeah, because they're nesting so frequently. Okay, and... Uh, we at Warwick, for the first time, I think, in many, many years, can actually smell what fresh air smells like, which is a very rare thing. So how are we going to go forward? If nothing comes out of this horror, yeah, the one thing we have to look at from this virus is we can't go back to normal because normal is actually killing the planet. Now, I'm a very small council, and as Councillor Dixon and Councillor Anderson said, we have very limited funds, but we don't have limited ideas, and we've got to change the way we're going forward. We are one of the most polluted towns in the whole of Great Britain. You can't tell that because we could only get two year figures. Councillor Dixon's put on it already. We cannot get up to date figures. We cannot get, you're interesting when you come up with your pollution figures and you'll put types of pollution which affects people and kills 40,000 people a year. We can't even unify the figures in our town centre. This has got to stop. So how are we gonna do this? I have been very encouraged, again, by the new Mayor of Leamington, and I've been very encouraged by the uh, Clean Air Warwick. I've had one meeting with a uh, fellow councillor who's part of that, and I'm very encouraged to hopefully join up with this. And the way forward, okay, is the only people and the last people who can save this. It's our children. We have many schools within Warwick. We can encourage them, come up with the ideas. We mentioned earlier about the pollution at schools. Yeah, the cars do run their engines. Yeah? Why don't the children tell them? Why don't we make it embarrassing like not wearing a seatbelt? Yeah, it's very easy schemes. Uh, Kenilworth have got a building program. Leamington not so much, but Warwick have got building programs. We're building new secondary schools. Where's the debate to say that we're not going to put cars there? We're, they're not going to be built for two to three years. Yeah. Where's the debate? Where's the debate with the district council? Where's the, de the debate with the Warwick County Council? These are small ideas we can bring forward. It doesn't cost us anything. We have to get into the schools. We have to evaluate what we can do. There's a lot of positivity. I used to be a fire officer. And I used to go into schools to promote smoke detectors. And if you're a certain age, don't tell me you haven't had leaflets saying stop, drop and roll 
to save your life, you all know you've got a smoke detector and you know you all have to have a smoke detector. It saved people's lives by the children promoting it and taking it home to the parents, embarrassing the parents into the situation. Why can't we have a poster campaign? Why can't we say, mommy, can you turn the engine off? Yeah. Why can't we show during this COVID that people aren't attending hospitals with chest problems? People aren't dying in the 40,000s with their asthmas and their polluted things. These are positive outcomes that we can get away from this. The, dif the, the district uh, uh, will be coming forward, the district and Alan Reid will be speaking, and they've got some fantastically great ideas. But like Councillor Gray said, you, you know, you've got to eat a little bit of the elephant at the time. These parks, these infrastructures, the paths, yeah, they've got to be effective to all district levels. We've just had road closures within Warwick without consultation. It, it's causing pollution. We haven't even thought about it when there's no cars on the road, how to reduce population figures. We haven't got one, one new electric charging point. We haven't got more than one bus route directly from Warwick Gates to town. 21,000 people without access to a bus. There are 47 routes to Leamington. So simple little things where we have to change our thinking, which doesn't cost money. These are very simple ways of going forward. Okay, the district's plans will be good. They will be good and we are coming down. We are pollution that is coming down. The ideas of cycling is very good. We have no cycle ramps. We've closed the town down for COVID on June the 15th, but where are we gonna put our bikes? You're not encouraging people now to get people off their bikes. I have a bike, I love cycling. I've lost weight, I don't know if you've all noticed, but I've lost weight because of, because COVID's done me good and my daughters are very proud of me. So I've changed, I've changed my ways, everyone will change their ways, but we've got to go forward. We will go forward and we will go forward, yeah, with the children, the children of the future. We've got to take small steps. We've got to get a way of monitoring pollution levels. We've talked to Clean Air Warwick, and I no doubt Clean Air Warwick will talk to Clean Air Leamington. Yeah, we will have regular pollution level activity. We will not be waiting two years. We will have the children on board. Why can't we get the children to council to tell them what their good ideas are so we can listen? We have to listen at Warwick County Council. We have to listen at District Council, and we have to listen as town councils. This doesn't cost anything, but it, without joined up thinking, we are going to achieve nothing. So I would like to see that there's not 30 reasons why we cannot do small things. With small steps, we can get the giant steps. We can get the secondary schools involved and we can embarrass parents once again into making sure that the pollution levels come down. It doesn't cost anything. We can make ideas. We can go forward. Uh, luckily for me, the Mayor of Kenilworth and Mayor of Warwick, uh, Kenilworth and uh, Leamington are very, very vocal in this thing. And again, by going on their bikes and not attending meetings and making our budgets yeah, not part of a car, then people will start to think and listen. But we, we've got to go forward and we can do this, okay? And we can make everything better if we join up and start thinking of the little things. We can't put a tree for every person if we can't maintain it. That will not be any good to anyone. Yeah? And it will just long-term have long-term problems. So every decision we make, every council, we have to have a voice to make sure it goes further. Kenilworth on their planning have 20 miles an hour. Why isn't it across the board? Why doesn't, uh, in the, in the, in the, in the built-up zones? Why, don't we, why are Kenilworth having that in their new planning regime? when it would benefit the whole of Warwick Dish. Things, simple little things like that. And again, with the 20 mile an hour, it delays the traffic. Yeah, it carries on with a continual flow. It delays pollution. These are very little things. And I'm coming to an end now because I'm waffling on. But uh, we could get one of our famous quotes one day. You'll never know, yeah? If we take the small steps, and we take a small step for man, you never know, it could be a giant step for mankind because it's the children are the last chance of saving the planet. Yeah. Thank you. But thank you very much, uh, Mayor Murphy. That was, um, 
enlightening. Thank you. They, you are right. The, the future belongs to the next generation. As far as I'm concerned, I'm, the, I'm on the departure lounge. But uh, so really, we are doing this for the young ones. Many of you know that as a P air quality people's chamber, we had a student assignment for schools last year. We made a presentation. I think uh, Mayor Rasmussen helped us to present those certificates at our engineering Midlands dinner. So I'm trying also to support the engineering institution to become involved. We are a bit shy. As engineers, we don't want to, to go out in the public and do this sort of thing. But behind the scenes, we, do, we are doing a great deal of work. So hopefully by um, bringing engineering institutions and academia with the counselors and good people like yourselves, uh, we can start at least talking to each other and we shouldn't wait every year. So the different groups can talk to each other and improvements can be made. But one thing is very important, what you said, the uh, Mayor Murphy, was if certain thing hasn't already been implemented, it's good to think how we can make improvements. If the schools are going to be built, we might as well build it away from the roads. And this idea of encouraging parents and uh, kids to understand what the problem is, that would help people not to drive. I used to drive a diesel. And uh, Susan told me, how can I have a a diesel car when I'm involved with a quality chamber. So I invest in a, a, a hybrid electric car. Uh, it was more expensive, but there you are. Uh, so we, we all can make a small changes and uh, those small changes can make an impact. Now, I have got a feeling that um, I, if, uh, if uh, anybody can join us later, they will do so. But I want to go um, and give the platform again to... Um, to, um, to the councillor Rasmussen, because she's going to chair the session on the council's efforts in improving air quality. And I think uh, one of our speakers is John Seedon. I can see his name. So maybe Susan, you can introduce him and then he could take the platform. She's new to No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm drawing breath and absorbing what my fellow mayors have been sharing. And I, I must just say, I think we're all saying the same thing. We all need to cooperate. We need to get together. We need to draw together all the enthusiasm and expertise that we possibly can, because the time is now. If it's not now, it, when? Brilliant. Okay, so I, I, I haven't got my sheet in front of me, but I am uh, extremely honoured to be asked to um, chair the committee and uh, try and keep some control over unruly participants. And um, am I understanding that Anne Lucas is no longer the person I'm going to be introducing first, but... Um, no, is you, you're going to your session with John Seedon and then, then the colleagues from the Warwick District Council. Uh, Councillor Alan Reed and his colleague. But first, uh, if you could, uh, we could ask John Seedon to make his presentation. So Head of Transport and Innovation, Coventry City Council, sounds like quite a big job. And I'm very ashamed to say that I don't know what you do. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to you telling us. And because Coventry is such a large and important part of our local area, um, I, I think we've got a lot to learn from you. And I know that you've been on a very at times tortuous journey in, in your efforts to improve air quality. And uh, I, I think in some ways, although you're starting from a low base point, you're leading in very many aspects. So um, please do, do, do let us share what you've been working on and thinking about. Over to you, John. Uh, thank you very much, Susan. And you know, thanks to everyone involved in putting the um, event together. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm Head of Transport and Innovation at Coventry City Council. That covers all aspects of transport strategy, but also transport technology and the ways we can actually improve the transport infrastructure and services within Coventry and across the West Midlands by investing in new technology. And we've done a lot of work, which I'll touch on briefly in the presentation, on electric vehicles, we're bringing electric buses into the city. Um, they should be in operation later this year. Uh, National Express have got them at the depot and they're starting to test. And we've also got a lot of investment going into um, helping businesses move to electric vehicles. So we've secured funding for 70 electric uh, vehicles, which the city council will own 
but we will loan them out to small businesses. So plumbers, electricians or whoever, if they're using a traditional van to get around the city, they can borrow an electric van off us, try it for two weeks, uh, try it for two months or so, and get the opportunity to make sure that it's financially viable for them and go ahead and hopefully then buy their own vehicle. You know, they're persuaded to sort of go electric. So we're doing a lot of work like that. Um, also I hear a lot of the comments about how we capture the impact of COVID on travel patterns. And I'll touch on that briefly. Uh, but before I start my main presentation, of, um, and uh, I think Matt Reston's still on the, the call, um, just sort of something to highlight in terms of some of the processes that we have to go through when politicians make announcements and people think, all right, that's it, we've got lots of money to spend on doing things, and then wonder why the council isn't doing things. So if we look at the recent investment in pop-up cycle rays and social distancing measures, the transport minister, and I don't know Matt's from a different party, so I'm not, this is not a dig at Matt or anything like that, this is a general political point. Um, the minister stood up on 9th of May to announce 250 million for emergency active travel measures. Uh, help people walk around their communities, help people cycle around their communities. Collectively, it took 18 days to get something from the DFT explaining how that money was going to be allocated. As authorities, we then had nine days to respond to tell the DFT how we were going to use the funding. And then it took another two weeks after that for the DFT to confirm those funding allocations. Now, bearing in mind the minister was saying this funding was for measures to be used and implemented in the shortest possible time within weeks. And yet, you know, we had a six week process to go through with DFT before we've actually got approval to spend that money. So just to give people a, an indication of what it's actually like when we're delivering these schemes, that even with something in an emergency situation, we have processes to go through. So you know, I just wanted to sort of make that point in general, because I know we've had a lot of people on at us, including uh, the likes of Adam Tranter as the, um, the cycling mayor, saying, what are you doing? Why aren't you pushing, why aren't you moving more quickly? You know, and it's because we've got processes to go through. Um, right, I'll provide you now with an update on where we are with the local action plan on air quality. So hopefully this worked earlier. So we can sort of uh, get to a shared screen. Hopefully people can see that. Yes, we can. Excellent. Right, I'll just sort of rattle through this because I'm sort of conscious you've got quite a lot to pack in. But just to run through the background for those that aren't aware, this has been touched on previously. In terms of Coventry taking action on nitrogen dioxide, uh, government direction back in 2017 identified that there was a need to take action. Um, we got some initial funding to do works in the Rollsgrave Road corridor out to the hospital, and a lot of that was actually working with schools and businesses to achieve modal shift for those local journeys and get people out of the cars for those short journeys. So picking up Council of the Heavens point around the school run, uh, that was very much part of that program. The, the funding was also, you know, basically, you know, to allow us to do more extensive monitoring. And that showed, um, as, as the professor sort of indicated earlier, there were major problems on Hollyhead Road. And we did a lot of extensive monitoring on all our major routes into the city and identified, yes, there was sort of a lot of key uh, problems and issues uh, that we needed to address. Hollyhead Road was the most critical. Worth saying that the challenge from government, it was focused on nitrogen dioxide, so I appreciate all the points around particulates, around ozone and so on, but this legal direction was specifically around NO2, so that's what, that's what we're tested by, you know, government against. Are we reducing NO2? And the other point is in the shortest possible time. So we've got a lot of really good long-term ambitions for Coventry around very light rail and bringing in sort of that light rail tram system as a mass transit around the city, hopefully get people out of their cars and onto trams. Again, that's going to take time to deliver. That doesn't meet the test that government set of bringing NO2 down in the shortest possible time. 
So if we sort of roll forward, in February 2019, we submitted our business case to government. We were proposing a £76 million package that included segregated cycle routes on four main corridors across the city, proposals to green the fleet, dynamic traffic management, and we did have to test a clean air zone as well as, um, uh, as a fallback option. So that package went in. Um, government came back, you know, to give them credit, they came back very quickly on that st sort of stage within six weeks and basically said, we want you to do more work on that preferred package. You know, at that point, they retained a clean air zone as an option, but they effectively said, refine your package, reduce the ask, make it more focused on the problem areas, particularly Hollyhead Road, rather than a citywide package. Now, we de didn't necessarily agree that that was the best way forward, but that was the direction from government. Um, just to put things in context, if we do, you know, if we did have to do a clean air zone, the, the area bounded in blue here, everything within that area would have been the boundary of the clean air zone within Coventry. Um, we did look at different options for clean air zone. This was the one which achieved the NO2 reduction. You can see a big crossover of some of the more deprived areas of Coventry, where people are less likely to be able to either afford replacing their car with an electric car or a modern car, or being able to afford to use public transport extensively. So, you know, we've got a big impact on socially deprived communities. 80,000 people live within, within that area of Coventry and businesses employing 27,000. So a major economic and social impact if we did do a clean air zone. So we developed our preferred option and submitted that last June. And the major change there, you may recall, we had a lot of discussion over whether we closed Camden Road at the level crossing to reduce that as a main route into Coventry. Uh, but there was a lot of local opposition to that um, from, from residents and communities either side of the crossing. So in our resubmission, we've kept Camden Road open. We've proposed an alternative layout in the area around Honeyhead Road, Upper Hill Street, Barrows Lane. Critically, we can still remove those traffic lights on Honeyhead Road, Barrows Lane, which is the real source of the queuing and congestion, which contribute to the NO2 levels on that route. And then if we roll forward, having submitted that information, um, as you'll all be aware, a lot of issues were happening in the autumn that the government had to grapple with. So it wasn't actually until February this year that the new government direction was issued. That confirmed that they accepted our refined package. It confirmed that we didn't need to do a clean air zone in Coventry. And it awarded us 24 and a half million in grant funding um, to actually implement that package. So that's the stage that we've reached. Just to put the context in sort of where the air quality problems are, um, in effect, through the modelling work and monitoring that we've done, the section of Hollyhead Road, and particularly the section at the city centre end, is the critical section in terms of air quality, uh, the area coded in red. We've got a secondary area on Foles Hill Road also in red, so very much aware of the need to do something on Foles Hill Road to reduce the amount of food traffic there, and we're working on those measures. And then the areas in low are of concern, but manageable. Um, we've already managed to get a lot of the, the air quality improved along the Rollscape Corridor through those early measures that were funded. But we need to be careful that around the Ring Road as well, that we're not creating problems in, in, in this area, although at least fortunately uh, there's not residents directly associated with the Ring Road, but we need to make sure that we don't just, when we sort out the head road, we don't just transfer the problem elsewhere on the network. So those are the two key focal points. In terms of uh, appreciate the points around sort of people saying it's all about sort of uh, dirty buses, dirty lorries and so on. Actually, um, we did a lot of survey work. We had access to DVOA database on the types of vehicle entering Coventry. We were able to proportion the uh, NO2 emissions on, the, on that basis. And consistently, every route coming to Coventry, pretty much half the vehicles contributing the NO2 were diesel cars. Um, yes, vans significant in a minority, around a fifth of the um, emissions coming from vans. Law is less critical. Bus is less critical other than on really dense bus corridors. But as I say, we're going electric with the buses anyway. Uh, we're already retrofitting with the bus companies the existing diesel vehicles to a higher standard. So the emissions from buses are less of a concern now. 
So in terms of the preferred option, uh, three core elements to it. The first is the modal shift, and that's really the working with schools, businesses, and local communities to encourage people to get out of their cars, to walk and cycle for local journeys. Um, that was sort of successful in the uh, Rollsgrave corridor, and we'll be looking to do the same on the Honeyhead Road corridor. To complement that, and we've um, just about to complete the initial consultation on Camden cycle route, that's a scheme which uh, would provide a segregated cycle route along Cowndon Road, linking the city centre to Cowndon. Um, basically, it's a four million pound scheme. It is fully segregated and it's basically going to provide, hopefully in combination with the engagement programme, the tool by which we can help people in that area and encourage them to cycle to the city rather than drive. And that takes cars then off the Honeyhead Road corridor. So that's all kind of the link there. And we also get obviously the side benefits that people referred to that if people are cycling more, they're fitter, they're healthier, less calls on the NHS and so on. So it's sort of uh, a win-win for us and we're, we're really keen to get that scheme uh, delivered. We're hoping to start on site uh, later this year, uh, but clearly we've got to consider the responses from the consultation and take those on board. And I've put in the chat a bit of detail about the mobility credit scheme. Somebody raised this question. This is jointly separately funded from the air quality plan, but it will enable people to trade in their old car and get credits to uh, basically travel either by bus, rail, uh, join the car club and use the car club vehicles or pull bike scheme and that comes in later this year. So it's sort of um, allowing people to travel more sustainably and trade in their car at the same time. In terms of greening the fleet, uh, a lot of this is funded by other grants, not just the air quality money, uh, but it's really around uh, the charge point network. Um, I think we're sort of second or third in the country at the moment outside London in terms of the number of charging points we've got across the uh, city. Uh, clean bus technology funder mentioned, converting all buses to clean diesels at the very least, but we've also got the 10 electric buses coming in uh, later this year. And we've put a bid into government for the all electric bus town uh, that's jointly with colleagues in Warwickshire and it will cover all buses within Coventry, all buses travelling out to uh, Nuneaton to the north on that corridor through Bedworth and to the south to Leamington. So, you know, in effect, that would have a massive transformation in the uh, bus network within the city. And then I mentioned the electric fleet by try before you buy scheme where we've got 70 electric vans, taxis and pool cars for businesses to try out uh, on a trial basis. And that's using funding we secured from High Raise England. And then finally, uh, we are also doing works on our High Raise to basically enable us to manage the traffic in a better way and be more responsive to air quality conditions as they happen live. That's a lot of it focused on Honeyhead Road, but being able to encourage traffic to use Spon End as an alternative route into the city, but that requires better arrangements on Spon End at the pinch point around the railway arches, so providing a bit more capacity on that route, but also remodelling Junction 7 and providing a much better pedestrian and cycle access across Junction 7 on the Ring Road into the city centre. The area around Hollyhead Road, we're proposing to put a low emission zone on Hollyhead Road, so we do strict access for the most polluting vehicles on Hollyhead Road but general access, cleaner vehicles would still be able to use it, but we would remove the signals at Barris Lane. That means we do need to open up Upper Hill Street. Um, so, you know, St. Osborne School, for example, would still have traffic on three sides of it, but we wouldn't have traffic on all four. Um, we've taken very sort of um, great care over the design of the, uh, the measures there to make sure that we minimise the impact on the school and on residents. But it's sort of a, a key part to getting the traffic off the most polluted bit of Honeyhead Road. And the work we've done on this, you know, it does indicate that, you know, the modelling we've done, we're not transferring the problem of any of this, and that's been accepted by government and their experts on, on air quality and on the uh, modelling side, that by putting these measures in place, we can solve the issues on Honeyhead Road, bring that into compliance, solve the issues on Falsall Road and bring that into compliance, but we don't transfer the problem elsewhere. So just sort of a few of the impacts, just to make sort of, um, you know, the key message is, you know, we are going to achieve NO2 compliance. We will retain local access, um, we are, but the key part is trying to improve those pedestrian and cycle routes from Spon End to the city centre and from Cowden to city centre. 
And in terms of the engagement side there, these are the figures from the early work in Rollsgrave. So eight, eight, eight and a half percent reduction in car journeys for school travel on that corridor. Uh, more people walking, cycling and sort of getting a traditional scooter. Um, 11 percent reduction in car trips from the local residents. Um, with more people walking, more people on, on the bus. And this is all figures that were before, obviously, COVID coming in. And the figures in terms of greening the fleet, sort of, uh, I'd say, 180 charge points installed by uh, this summer, and we're bidding for more. Um, I'll probably not linger on these schemes too much. They've been on the, um, on the website through the consultation program, but this is the spot end scheme. So this is the problem at the pinch point of the railway arches. So it is making it, in effect, a smoother flowing route into the city centre which means you don't get the queuing in this area, you don't get the queuing back along here, and the residents on either side aren't then exposed to uh, as bad air quality as a result. And taking the roundabout array here, remodeling the junction, you see a lot more green space, public realm space, so we're looking to actually plant trees, landscaping, green walls, and that sort of thing. So we make the junction work better, make it better for pedestrians and cyclists, and make it a better public realm. Uh, Upper Hill Street, I say this is the real problem bit of Honeyhead Road coming into Junction 8. So we're closing the junction there by the day's hotel. So again, Honeyhead Road becomes free of flowing. The low emission zone means that the dirty vehicles are kept out. It is just the cleaner vehicles using it. Uh, Upper Hill Street, a left in left out arrangement, which means that traffic from Camden can still access the city centre, but will be forced around the top side of the ring road there. And uh, obviously the other side is we've got the former gas work site at the top here, which is a development site and it helps manage traffic uh, generated by that development in a more sustainable way as well. And then the cycle route basically going from the city centre at the bottom right out to Cowden top left and sort of, um, let's say, You'll be able to go on the consultation website and see the, the pictures and we've got CGI images of what it will look like, but it's basically this sort of, sort of thing. So it is going to be a separate footway, separate cycleway, separate traffic. So it's not an on-road cycleway, it is fully segregated. I've mentioned the various support we're doing on um, electric vehicles. We're also supporting businesses in accessing funding for charge points at their businesses. Uh, trying to get the information out to people on how they can access charge points to go in at their home and obviously we've been doing a lot on street residential charge points as well so i think the next few slides this is just sort of showing you the spread of charge points um, already implemented in the city uh, these are the rapid ones so they give a faster charge to vehicles uh, so if you're shopping or if you're popping in somewhere for a couple of hours you get a full charge from these points these are the areas covered by on-street residential charges, which are the overnight charges, which we sort of uh, are fed from street lights, a pillar by the side of the road. And those are our residents where they don't have their own parking to access charging sort of on street. And the new bus routes going out, um, these are where the electric buses will be running on the route out to the hospital, the route out to uh, Bedworth via Poles Hill. Uh, so again, targeting our more, more polluted routes. In terms of COVID impacts, uh, we've been doing some sensitivity testing on this. This is kind of showing where the top orange bar is where air pollution is stabilised against uh, the baseline at the start of March. So you can see, broadly speaking, it's been running at 60% and fairly consistently. And that's sort of NO2 levels. Uh, car traffic went down to 40%, slowly increasing, and we're now running at about 70% to 80% in terms of the normal flows. But public transport use is well down um, and in the city up to the start of June uh, the footfall was again about 20% of what we we're experiencing on a normal day. Shops are now reopened so that will be higher uh, but we're very much wanting to capture the benefits of reduced travel um, into the city and in terms of air quality impacts I think is again showing that you know, reduced traffic does reduce and improve the air quality, um, but there's a certain level, there is, and there are background levels which, you know, broadly speaking, seem to be around 25 for nitrogen, um, below which we don't seem to be able to sort of get down just by reducing car traffic. So where we are at the moment, we've finished the consultation on the main air quality. We're going to our cabinet in July and the 21st. 
we work up our full business case submission to government by the end of October, and that's sort of um, a date which we've agreed of them uh, informally and awaiting on ministerial confirmation that um, the minister is happy with that date. But we are commencing implementation of an action plan, hence the count and consultation. We're getting geared up to start our engagement programmes with schools and businesses um, from September, when they're getting back to some kind of normal operation, hopefully. And we'll be obviously trying to get work on the count and cycle scheme started um, in the autumn. And the aim is we're delivering all those infrastructure measures by the end of 21, but the engagement programme continues for uh, two years beyond that. I right, appreciate that's been a bit of a whistle stop tour. So that's sort of basically um, overview of where we are in Coventry um, on the rider programmes. Susan, I should think you have to unmute. Um. Sorry, you, you'd think I'd never done it before. I'm no, no, <laughs> I'm just saying John has <laughs> obviously time. finished. Maybe we could have one or two burning questions if they are. And I then, think, uh, I, yes, I, I'm sure having heard that, Razor, we've all got lots of questions. I'm dying to ask some, but why don't we open it up to the, the, the floor first? Yes. Who would like to ask Mr. Seddon about Coventry's plans? I think Tony wants. Tony, if you are going to ask a question, could you unmute then, please? And there's a little thing you can press yeah, to, you have uh, to want attention. And, and Mayor, Mayor Neil Murphy is um, right. The, the question coming is, after Tony. Then Tony first, then Neil Murphy. You know, it's a very simple question. I was very impressed with the idea of lending electric cars to people to get them excited about electric vehicles, especially for local traders and that sort of thing. How successful has it been and has it been taken up? Right, we've had, um, so far we've had uh, two projects, um, one of which was part of our early measures programme in Rollsgrave Road and we basically um, in effect leased four taxis from the LEVC who manufactured the London taxis. Um, so I had four electric taxis. Those were available for our local taxi drivers to use. Um, so they would leave, they would borrow them for two weeks. So their own taxi would be stored in our depot. They would take the electric taxi for a two week period and trial it. Um, we've had about, I think over the two years that's been running, um, the vehicles have been out pretty much all the time. So we've had somewhere in the region of 120, 130 taxi drivers take that up. Um, from that, we've had 13. Have they bought any new vehicles at that? As a result? Yeah. From, from, from that, we've had 13 have gone ahead and bought the taxi or, or leased it from LEVC, but the 13 have gone ahead. Not as high as I would like, and there's a long way to go because there's 850 licensed um, taxi yeah. carriages in, in Coventry, so we've got a long way to go with it. Um, but it is a challenge of the economics on taxi industry. Um, the second scheme I referred to, that's only just started. We got the funding um, in March from Highways England. We've got the orders out for the first set of vehicles. So we're hoping in the autumn that we'll be launching that out to local businesses, but it will operate in the same basis. So, you know, a plumber or an electrician who's got an old diesel van, will be able to sort of borrow the electric van for uh, we're looking at a two month period to give them a really good chance to test it out in all conditions and to really convince themselves. Um, so, uh, as I say, we're hoping we've already had a reasonable amount of interest in that, but we're, we're hoping to launch that in the autumn formally once the vehicles, first vehicles arrive. I mean, I, I think that's a superb scheme because there's so many small one man businesses that are driving around in, in transits, which would be a logical move to move to electric vehicles. So I, I, I just, very impressed with it. Thanks. Uh, could we have uh, Neil Murphy and then Councillor Keith Condecor indicated next? 
Uh, yeah, uh, I'm very encouraged by the, the scheme, and I think it's really, really good. There's a couple of things. As a one-man band in a in a van who has to travel to Coventry, uh, and unfortunately, the price of a van is uh, very extensive. I'd love to get out of my van, but mm -hmm. for one person, it's very difficult. The other side of this one, coming into Hollyhead Road, you say about a pollution, the most polluting vehicles won't be allowed in. Is that a a charging scheme or just not allowed in because would that not affect the businesses in the city centre as they have big deliveries from nationwide? Yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's not a charging scheme, it will be a restriction. So, so basically in the same way as if you've got a, a bus gate and a vehicle which isn't a bus goes through it, it gets fined. It would be the same approach, you know, so if, if a car, um, goes through and it's a non-compliant vehicle and, and you know, we'll have a mechanism for people to check whether their vehicles are compliant but broadly speaking it's uh, you know, any, any diesel car after 2016 would be okay, any diesel car older than 2016 would not be. Um, but essentially the more polluting vehicles if you did go through the zone you'd be fine for it and there is a major exercise to be done to actually um, get the communications right on that to make people know whether they're going to be in a compliant vehicle or not. So it's not, not an easy option, but it's one that, you know, we felt we had to bring forward to get the worst of the vehicles out there. But it's only Hornhead Road and the distance of Hornhead Road that they're banned from. So, you know, oh. vehicles will be able to plan another route. So it's not banning everything from the city centre. People will be able to come on other routes into the city centre where the pollution levels are not as critical in effect. It's just simply because Hollyhead Road is so, you know, as, as the professor said, is, is so much higher in terms of its NO2 levels. Yeah, brilliant. And can I just have a, a secondary question on the, uh, I'd love electric van. Any schemes going ahead where it's affordable for very poor councillors? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, um, you know, it will depend on what van you use. I mean, the, the economics are getting better um, because the, the volume of manufacturers is improving. So there's a lot more, um, you know, sort of uh, cheaper options coming through. And the manufacturers are seeing the way things are going and the car dealerships are seeing the way things are going in terms of the government's move to, you know, in effect, eliminate all new petrol and diesel sales by, you know, 20, 2035 is the latest they've been talking about now, um, but it might even come forward earlier than that. So um, I think there will, there will be deals to be done there. Um, the, the range of vans we've got, you know, they do range from small vans, you know, sort of uh, the car type bodies uh, to the transit type vans. You know, so whatever your business, you would get an opportunity to try one out and see how it felt and how the economics work for you in terms of fuel consumption, because obviously that's the key win for business is they save a lot of diesel. Thank, thank you, John. I've just had a note that there are questions from the audience. So could we go then to Councillor Condecor, then Alan Marshall? I think those are the two um, I've noted. And then we can have some questions from the audience. If you could just... Um, be as brief as you could in your questions to John. Thanks. Very briefly, I cycle Coventry north to south quite a lot when I'm going across the city. It's great having this dedicated cycle route, but a lot of places you'll need to cycle the rest of the city. Can we have some money spent on extending the things up to traffic lights? And you've got these little cycle lanes um, that go about 20 metres, and it takes you about four cycles of the cycle lights to actually get onto the bit where you've got a nice bit of painted keep clear so i think it's good to do the big project but we actually need to make the cyclists whiz through the rest of the traffic lights and junctions thank you yeah. I, I can't tell you how much i echo that question there's no point in having a cycle path if it's not joined up to everything else thank you John, did you want to respond to that or are you just taking a note of the comment? I think it's just sort of, yeah, it's sort of taking a note. We are mindful that, you know, the routes we're proposing are the spine routes, um, that we will need to make sure we've got the right feeders into them. And there will be corridors which won't have spine routes, which, you know, we'll need to improve. And one of the things we're looking at on Falls Hill Road, for example, which I think is quite a challenge for cycling, um, is 
through the emergency active travel fund, we will be putting a pop-up cycle lane on Falls Hill Road, which will then hopefully become permanent and might, you know, might or hopefully make it easier for Keith in terms of cycling on the north side of Coventry. And Alan, I think you were waiting. No, I may have tinkered with the wrong button, but I haven't oh, got so it. <laughs> Not like me then. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, Moni, I think you've got some questions from the audience. Yes, I do. So from Pamela, is the EV loan available to businesses in Tile Hill, for example? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah so certainly Tile Hill would be covered. Mm -hmm. Um. From David, will Coventry 2021 present any special challenges to CCC in terms of air quality? And if so, how do you plan to deal with them? Um, well, we've got a travel plan um, which was basically produced before COVID. Um, it's now being reviewed um, I think people, I think it's been announced today that City of Culture will run from May to May, so May 21 to May 22. Um, we're starting as a result now to get a bit more um, certainty as to the shape of City of Culture. Obviously they were well developed on their programme, we're ready to start launching and announcing things and then Covid came along. And at the moment, we're still in a position where we don't quite know what shape events will be. So will we still have, you know, um, you know, the vision of 100,000 or 150,000 people descending on Coventry City Centre for a mass participation event? Or is it going to be more of a digital online event? You know, at the moment, the original travel plan was assuming there would be a number of major events with mass travel into the city. And there would be then a lot of smaller events across the city throughout the year. Um, the big events are the ones which have caused the spike in terms of travel demand. And obviously we're working with train companies, bus companies, so on to make sure those are met. Um, and that people are steered through the ticketing systems to book their travel by train rather than by car. And if they do come by car, we were looking at temporary park and rides to keep them on the edge of the city and bus them into the centre so or to the venue. So we're looking to manage things in those ways. Um, but as I say, it's a bit up in the air again until we see what the shape the revised City of Culture programme will be in the post-COVID world. Okay, so Ian asks, the technology to recognise the vehicles and charge them isn't there yet. How will, we, how will you deal with that? Um, well, the, the technology is there. Um, it's not all gone through final type approval and the systems which government, um, you know, basically the Joint Air Quality Unit, which is between DEFRA and DFT, um, they took on the, the responsibility of putting the checking systems in place. So for things like the clean air zones in Birmingham and Leeds and so on, a vehicles recorded go into the zone the system behind that to check whether that vehicle is compliant or not is the one that um, government's relying on uh, developing. That's not moved as fast as government would like in the best form of IT projects. So that's the bit which needs to be put in place to make a low emission zone work. The camera technology is there, but it's the back office systems. But by the time we actually come to implement that stage, you know, Based on what government is saying to Birmingham and Leeds and the timescale for Birmingham and Leeds clean air zones to come in place, uh, those systems will be up and running and tested. Okay, uh, Richard Dixon also asks, um, I don't know if he wishes to just speak from um, his Thank panel. You. Thank you, Mark. Uh, John, I wonder if you can tell me what the City Council is doing to engage with local employers, uh, like one of its two uh, universities, to nudge them to reduce the air travel of their staff because it's all very well what we're doing locally in the city mm -hmm. but I know that at least one of our two local universities still quite happily lets its staff travel around the world pretty freely. Mm -hmm. um, 
I suppose, I mean, our focus of the universities is the travel to and from the campus locally, um, which is the bits that we can control in, or the bits which affect our, the network we control in terms of um, bus and road and cycle way. So we do a lot of work with both universities on their travel planning for staff and students. Um, in terms of you know, whether their staff are travelling by air or sort of whatever mode to meetings they're going, um, that's outside our influence really. Um, and you know, so it's not something that we actively engage with them on. We're more concerned with them getting in and around the city of Coventry in the most sustainable way. I could jump in there perhaps and contribute the little I know. Even before COVID-19 struck, there was a growing discussion in local universities about, uh, I, I presume, um, Richard, you're referring to conference flying and so forth. There was beginning to be some disquiet about the air miles that are clocked up by academics who, who fly to conferences. And I think two things have happened post COVID. Firstly, universities generally are under a lot more financial pressure um, for various reasons. Uh, and they'll be looking to reduce expenditure wherever possible. And secondly, one of the unexpected uh, and unintended consequences is that like us, academics are finding that conferences are much more possible via Zoom, via other platforms. <laughs> other platforms are also available. So there will never be anything to replace the face-to-face -face human contact or the little chat in the corridor afterwards or a drink in the bar that will really spark ideas or create relationships. So I, I think like many other things, it will change profoundly academic air travel. I, sorry to jump in and maybe take someone else's space. Is there another question? Thank you, Susan. Uh, I believe Peter has a question for John. Um, there seems not to be any changes to the plan post COVID. Is this the case? Um, if not, what has changed? Um, well, as part of the, um, the full business case development, I said that's going to government in October. And we will be doing sensitivity testing as part of that. And we're sort of and, and that's not just around air quality, that's around the rider um, transport network, other schemes that we've got that are proposed and the business cases for those. Um, clearly, we're in a position at the moment where we're all speculating across the transport industry, as people in other industries are, on what the impacts will be on travel demand. The evidence at the moment from surveys carried out nationally and more locally in the West Midlands are that you know, perhaps you know, sort of around a third of people who used to be bus users will no longer use the bus. That's actually balanced by around 14% of people saying they will use the bus more and I I'm guessing that there's an impact of, you know, on the one hand, people afraid to use public transport because of transmission of virus or the risk of it being balanced by some people saying, actually, I'm appreciating the clean air in the city. I used to drive around for my local journeys. I'm no longer going to do that. I'll hop on the bus instead. Yeah, so people are making those sort of value judgments, but the net, you know, there will be a net decrease in bus use. There'll be a net decrease in rail, at least in the short to medium term. And there'll be a net decrease we anticipate in peak hour traffic. So I mentioned during the presentation that at the moment with the shops reopening and so on, we're back to about 70% of traffic levels compared to what you would expect normally this time of year. Um, in the morning peak, we're at 50%. Yeah, so you know, there's a lot fewer journeys coming in the morning peak than there are later in the day. So people are, and that's I think is a reflection, particularly in the city centre, of the degree of office developments. Offices like our base at Frygate. I mean, um, I've 
I was in Coventry on Wednesday for a site visit with members and that was my first visit to Coventry since mid-March and it hasn't stopped the work happening, it hasn't stopped my team working but it's just reflecting that we don't need to travel into the office to do our job effectively. Yes, we're so, all working in, in different ways, aren't we John? Yeah, we um, are. Are, are. Are there any more questions coming from the floor? I'm, I'm conscious that uh, Councillor... So, I think we have one from Ian if he unmutes as well as Merle. Yep. Mm -hmm. Both have microphones. Ian McDermott. I was, uh, sorry, I apologise. Like, uh, so I didn't realise it was mine was the Ian. Is my okay. question the one to... Uh, um, I had two questions to posted. Neil Murphy. Say again? To Neil Murphy, I think you had a question. That's indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Um, I've only heard trees mentioned twice today, so I've only got two questions to ask. And obviously one of those was to Neil Murphy. He said he couldn't afford to maintain one tree per person that lives in his area. Yet the WMCA have a, 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 an ambition to plant one tree for every resident in the whole of the combined authority area. Is he saying that um, he can't move budget money around in order to maintain trees and he would sooner spend that elsewhere? Given the fact that his authority brought in £154,000 in fines last year, he couldn't move a little bit of it across to maintain the trees? Thank you for the question. It wasn't quite what I stated. It's, uh, I'm all for uh, getting uh, trees for one person per household in our county. What I stated is as we go forward with 72,000 trees, we'll have to maintain them trees. So we have to discuss how we're going to go forward with that. What we're not doing is joining the councils up. So as we make these decisions and they're positive decisions, We've also got to look at how we're going to make it a positive outcome. And that's part of the council. Yes, I agree with you. Yes, I want trees everywhere. I want the greenest part of land. And I want electric vehicles and hydrogen vehicles. But as we make these decisions, we've got to look at the long-term sustainability. I'm not saying do not plant trees. I want trees. I think we have a question from Mel Goering to John. Could we, could we make this pretty much the last one, Moni? Yeah. Uh, John, hi, good afternoon. So I've put two fairly technical questions on the chat for you, but I realize there's a much larger question behind them. And the question is this, are you willing to engage the public more and put more information into the public domain? Uh, the recent consultation on an air quality plan was accompanied by extremely skimpy uh, published material. We didn't get to see the modeling, we didn't get to see the options, we didn't get to see the discussions. I have now obtained a good deal of information through the Freedom of Information Act. And I think the point I want to really want you to respond to is that the impulse of bureaucracy is to be secretive. But actually, there are very large scale evidence based studies that better environmental decisions are made with the involvement of the public. So I'm ask, asking, actually asking you to let go of the desire to control all this, to let go of the typical council secrecy, and to put the full information into the public domain. Um, and then I have two technical questions to follow on to that. So from this freedom of information material, it's evident to me that there are different maps circulating of where the areas of concern are for excess pollution. Mm -hmm. And we've only seen the most favorable one on the council website. So will you actually just trust us and publish them all and explain why they're different? So that's, what, that's one point. And the other is, can we really trust these plans being made? You know, looking at the Atkins, you know, scoping document for this, which you'll be very familiar with, W.S. Atkins or the consultants and engineers, they noted there's a problem. And that problem is that the government, the big government model, which is behind so much of this, it's called the PCM model, the pollution climate model, is very significantly underestimating the amount of pollution that exists currently. So that exists, that suggests a validation problem. You know, is this model 
upon which we're pinning our hopes for the future, that we're going to get better air to breathe, is it actually working well enough to help us? Mm -hmm. Are we going to go through all the pain of doing this and discover that uh, actually didn't work out in the rosy way planned because the model wasn't good enough, didn't account for our local conditions? You know, the Atkins keep saying, well, we weren't, didn't, weren't aware of street canyons here, we weren't aware of slow traffic there, and we weren't aware of this, and we weren't aware of that. It, the national model can't account for those things. So really, I'm asking you, um, in this regard, you know, how, why should we have confidence in the predictions that the future is going to be better? So there's a series of, oh, of, of several uh, questions. One main rhetorical question at the beginning about public engagement and a slightly more specific uh, set of questions there, John. Would you, would you care to address those? Um, I'll address them. I'll try and be as brief as I can. But the, in terms of the modelling, the PCM model, you know, in, in my presentation, I said it kicked off in 2017 with the initial direction from government. The basis for that direction was the government's analysis using the PCM model, which is a national model. That model basically takes traffic counts from the main roads. It then takes an assumed vehicle mix because the traffic counts weren't necessarily robust in terms of the count of the volume of the traffic, but not necessarily the makeup of that traffic. And then it did an assumed vehicle mix based on proportion of diesel cars, electric cars, petrol cars of varying ages based on the national fleet rather than what's happening in Coventry. So the initial PCM modelling that DFT, uh, that the DEFRA used for that original direction said Coventry you've got a problem, this is where we think you've got a problem and the network that they showed where he had a problem, did not include Honeyhead Road. Honeyhead Road was fine, according to their modelling. So, as part of the direction, the initial work we got was to do, initial funding allowed us to do detailed modelling on all the radial routes into Coventry. That included detailed traffic surveys given as the precise vehicle mix and we used cameras given as number plates of vehicles entering Coventry. Government gave us permission to relate those to the DVOA database so that's where those pie charts in the presentation came with the proportion of diesel cars, vans and so on. That's where that data originally came from. You know, so we had a very detailed knowledge then of what traffic was entering Coventry. We had very detailed air quality modelling and have to confess that when we first modeled, first monitored Honeyhead Road, we did not believe the figures because they were too high. We thought the equipment must be faulty. We positioned them in various locations on Holyhead Road, various configurations, tried different types of equipment, worked closely with DEFRA's officials to confirm, you know, were we doing everything right? Did they think of anything else we could do to ensure that we had robust figures? And that's where we arrived at the figure of in the high 50s, basically, ultimately out of that. I say that did not reflect the PCM modeling at all. So the package that we've produced is not based on the PCM modeling, it's based on our own modeling. That has been through 18 months of scrutiny by DEFRA and their experts. Uh, it's been through robust challenge, it's been through independent technical panels and so on. Um, and you know, essentially, government has come back to us and said, at the end of that process, yes, we're fine, we're comfortable with your modelling, we're comfortable with the conclusions. So it has been very robustly done. The reason why we're careful with what actually goes in the public domain from the technical reports is that through that process, there have been countless maps prepared, countless technical reports prepared, there have been in the region of 35 different scenarios tested in the modeling of different combinations of measures. And each of those were contributing in effect to a work in progress and were subject to then scrutiny internally between us and our consultants, scrutiny between us and DEFRA and their technical experts. So there's a lot of work that goes in there 
Now you can take one plan or one scenario from any of that work and you can say, oh, right, yeah, that looks fine. That suits my argument. I'm going to take that as my base. But, you know, we had, you know, through that process, you find things like um, in the traffic model, there was a simple technical issue in the city centre about where one car park zone was loading onto the network. In the scheme of something as a street unit model, it would have made no difference. In the context of the amount of traffic on Hollyhead Road and the Ring Road, it made a big difference. So finding out that sort of sort of uh, technical issue through that process, you find, oh, hang on, that's why that model run is showing this particular characteristic. That's not correct. We need to correct that. If we publish everything out there, all the working, all the way through, people would pick that up, pick up a plan which was probably not accurate, and then say, oh, that's the position, not the one you published at the end. So that's why we're very careful with what goes out. We need to make sure it is the validated accurate data that goes out, the technical reports which have been through all the technical challenges uh, by the experts and you know it does go on the website ultimately alongside the consultation but we need to be certain that we are presenting things which are robust um, in, in terms of the evidence base so so that, that's why we don't put everything out there. Mel, does that, does that go some way to addressing your questions or could you continue the conversation later? Uh, it, 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 it's a big conversation. It's one about trusting the public. And it's about, we have a right under an international treaty to participate in environmental decision making. Yep. And really we need the full information to be able to do that. You have to trust us. Yep. You may not like it, may be uncomfortable, but you will actually get the better results in the end when you have many many people of many talents looking at information looking at data and helping you you know if you, if you if you see us just as adversaries it's just storing up trouble it just means we're going to be suspicious we're going to think you know something's being put over on us um and you know we're not going to take a cooperative attitude well you i think have us on your side or have us against you sorry to interrupt you mel when i'm introducing our next speaker I might just wrap up your questions with putting a question to him. Uh, it's Alan Reed, Councillor Alan Reed of Warwick District Council, Environment Portfolio holder. And uh, just as a way of introduction, I would just say that um, you might have something to say on the question of involving the public. I don't know if you would just very briefly want to share that to answer what Merle is discussing, if we could merge the two conversation streams there. I, I know in Warwick District Council, you've been having some thoughts about effective public engagement. Thank you, Susan. Um, I take it you can all hear me, yes? Yeah. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Well, first of all, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Susan says, my name is Alan Reid and I'm a Conservative Warwick District Councillor and I am the portfolio holder for the environment. First, I'd like to congratulate you for convening this conference. And in many ways, it is most timely. It's timely because our environment has been a renewed focus for most of our population. And it's particularly timely because the coronavirus pandemic has further focused everyone's attention on behavior and how we should all think again how best to conduct our lives. While air quality is rightly the theme of this conference, I'm going to talk about our Council's Climate Change Emergency Action Plan since they are closely linked. Tackling climate change not only addresses the wider concerns of the climate, but it also benefits the health of the local community by tackling many of the environmental issues that cause Ill, Ill health. First, our plan has two targets. The first is for our council itself to be carbon neutral by 2025. And the second is with others to have our district carbon neutral by 2030. 
Now, a lot has, a lot has already been said, uh, but I, I, I need to repeat it, because the two biggest causes of pollution, and thus poor air quality, are transport and buildings. And I set out our council's actions and plans in addressing these two major causes. On transport, our actions and plans include the following. First, plans for electric vehicles, including electric buses, electric waste collection vehicles, which incidentally are manufactured in our, in our district, as well as having our council's car fleet to be 100%, and it's, it is already 65%. It's interesting, actually, that Warwick District is the second highest for electric vehicle car registrations in the whole country. Next, we're going to be installing charging points in all of the council's car parks. We've introduced a car sharing scheme for all our employees. We've introduced the Better Points Scheme, which rewards council staff for walking or cycling to work. With others, we're building a more extensive cycling and walking infrastructure. We plan to install park and ride and park and stride projects on the outskirts of all of our towns. We're considering introducing a differential car parking regime to encourage electric vehicles. We're also going to be converting all of our taxes to electric. Interestingly, it came up earlier about uh, schools and cars idling. We're also uh, introducing an anti-idling policy. We're also investigating hydrogen as an alternative to electric. But we think that this is this re going to require some national approach. And finally, on transport, Increasing home working, which as a result of the pandemic has highlighted how effective this has been in reducing staff travel by holding virtual meetings. On buildings, our actions and plans include the following. We are purchasing 100% green energy. We're changing heating systems from fossil fuels to renewables. We're introducing LED lighting to reduce energy consumption. We're improving the insulation in all of the council's properties. We're introducing solar PV on council buildings and we're planning a solar PV farm. We're planning for a district heating system to all of our council, or most of our council buildings in the town. We're reviewing the local plan as we have to, and we're compiling a DPD, which is a development plan document on sustainable housing. It's one of my most urgent considerations ever since I became a councillor 14 years ago. We keep on building homes with the same old fossil fuel energy heating systems. That has got to change. And again, home working, which is reducing the need for large office gatherings, and less need for a large office space. Finally, we, we've been discussing with National Grid the potential for introducing hydrogen into the gas pipeline system. This would require hydrogen ready boilers to be installed in any property. We are currently experiencing the temporary measures installed in our town, town centers to limit traffic and the reallocation of road space for cycling and walking to, to permit social distancing. Now, while there have been some protests, I believe that these can be resolved by evolution. My own opinion is that this enforced change in behavior will become the norm, and perhaps these temporary measures can become more permanent. That's it, Susan. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Um, any questions for Alan about Warwick District Council's ambitious but achievable, as I said earlier in my, uh, in, in, in my own uh, slot, ambitious but achievable carbon targets? Hello? 
ask a question. Is that all right? Alan, just a very simple question. You talked about introducing hydrogen into the electricity supply. How does that work? No, no. Hydrogen into the gas system. There's, oh, a, sorry, there's a pilot scheme. There's a pilot scheme in Keele University at the moment where they're introducing 30% hydrogen into the gas system. And uh, that, that is something that National Grid are looking at in, in great detail. Obviously, the infrastructure of, of gas pipelines, which I got involved in for most of my working career, could be converted to hydrogen, but uh, there needs to be a lot of uh, uh, look at this before it becomes a reality. But it's, it's something that would substantially decrease the use of fossil fuels. I have to say, by the way, I'd like to congratulate John Seddon on, on, the, on the actions that Coventry are doing. It actually highlights one important point. Coventry have the advantage of having everything under one roof. In other words, their council looks after everything. Here at the district, we don't have that advantage. We have to have joined up thinking with many other councils, including the, the, the county council. And that is one of our biggest challenges. Yes, I, that, that, that was another thing, Alan. I don't know if you heard that I, I highlighted as one of the boulders stopping the flow of the river. Uh, we need much more joined up cooperation between the people who are responsible for monitoring air quality, for public health, transport planning. That's certainly true. Correct. Uh, and, and, and until we have that joined up thinking, it's going to be difficult for us to achieve the carbon neutrality of the district by 2030. Yeah. And, and such things as cycleways and things like this, while we're putting cycleways in our developments, unless they are joined up and go anywhere, we're at a disadvantage. I think many would agree with you. Including me. <laughs> Hello, Neil Murphy, are you trying to um, join in? I'm so sorry. Moni, are there any questions from our audience? Um, I think it might wait because I don't know if we're a bit pressed for time because I know we'll have a further question session later on. Yeah, I think um, we're fine at the moment if anybody wants to address uh, Councillor Reid directly. I don't think there are any particular questions for Councillor Reid in particular. Okay, great. Well, I, I understand there's, there's now an opportunity for uh, Dave Barber to, um, to join us and, and share what he's doing at Warwick District Council. Uh, forgive me, Dave, I don't know what your precise title is, but you are now the officer who is working very closely with Councillor Reid, steering the climate emergency response. Is he there? Latvia, are we, are, we, um, are we talking with Dave Barber at all? Yeah, I've uh, unmuted his microphone, so he should be able to, to oh, speak wow. now. The, the joys of a virtual conference. <laughs> Is he? I've got one Barbara says, Barbara. Most man is that the one? Uh, Dave Barber. Dave Barber, let me see. Um, White District no, Can't see him in the. Alan, I thought you were expecting Dave to. Um... No, yes. I can't see him in the, in the audience. Yes, I, I, I was too, but I, I, I'm looking at my emails before I joined you. He, he's very busily involved with our chief executive on some important matter, so it's probably. Uh, he's tied up, but um, I, I'll, I'll see if I can contact him uh, and see if he can participate. But I, I think you need to move on at the moment. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for that. Perhaps he can join us at a time when, when he does become free. Because I, I, I think one of the positive things that Warwick District Council has done is to appoint a programme manager to uh, restructure the whole approach of the District Council so that they're really focusing on their climate change agenda, which can only be good news for anybody who's interested in air pollution. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Susan, for chairing this session. Before we go for the lunch break, I was, I was gonna introduce uh, Dr. Habib Kashi 
for, to hear his presentation, then we will have a break and then we will come back. But just before giving the platform to Dr. Kashi, I just wanted to tell um, Councillor Reed that one of the things I have noticed because I've been interacting with WDC for a different reason is um, it's very important to have a joint action group um, for especially when it comes to climate change, because the dealing with different district council ha has not been very helpful from an individual point of view. But of course, that is a, a problem for you to, not a problem, but a challenge for you to resolve. So, okay, we can go to Dr. Habib Koshi. He's going to talk to us a little bit about air quality and health. Dr. Koshi, the platform is yours. You have to unmute before you talk, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. I, I've, I've learned that uh, now. Uh, thank you very, very, very much, Reza. Um, I'm going to read from uh, a little bit of a script just to, uh, um, do I have to share my screen? Why is this not working? Dr. Am I there? Uh, Hello. If you, yeah, if you, move, uh, if you scroll, move your cursor down at the bottom of the screen, you should be able to see a button called share screen, it's a green color. If you press that one, it should allow you to share your screen. I did, uh, I did do that, but it uh, didn't seem to actually allow me to do that. Technology, technology, share yeah. screen again. There you go, share. Oh, you're Is there. there. Yeah, you're there, yes, yes you are. That's it. Okay. Technology. Is it there now? Yes, yes, we can see it. You can enlarge it if you wish. Are yes. People see, are people see my screen? Good, 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 good. I'm better with my hands than with computers as a surgeon, so I promise you. So I'll just start to say thank you for asking me to speak to this meeting. I did attend the meeting last year and learned quite a lot from the presentation and discussions. And I've been really quite impressed uh, this morning with our uh, uh, local politicians and their commitment uh, to uh, uh, changing and improving our air quality. My own interest in air pollution is firstly because of my profession, because I, I see its detrimental effects firsthand on patients. Secondly, and this is where I'm venting my spleen, and please forgive me uh, 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 if you can. Uh, I was a chairman of our local resident association, which is really at the edge of uh, Coventry with Warwickshire and I was anxious about air pollution on our main road and the effect of additional housing that was being planned by populations uh, was increasing to such an extent that it couldn't cope which we know was obviously quite inaccurate and incorrect. Sadly our concerns were completely ignored both by Warwickshire and Coventry and their plans went ahead. And the, when I attended the planning meeting, the Warwick view was that this is house building for Coventry, so you might as well put it at the edge of Coventry, so they get all the bad effects of it, which sadly is exactly where I live. But there we go. Having vented my spleen, I'll, I'll, I'll get back to, to my talk. And I'd like to say that all of the information on the slides that I'm going to present is available uh, uh, on, uh, in public domain. It is from Public Health England, World Health Organization, and the United States Environment for uh, Environment. None of this is my research. I, I don't do any specific research. In you can see that World Health Organization considers that 90% of our children currently breathe toxic air. And I think quite a few of our presenters have said that uh, we're all uh, getting on in our years. It's the children that really matter. And this is a shameful statistics. And one that I think if we ignore our children will we'll never, for, we'll never forgive us. Now, cost to health. Now, as a doctor, the easiest thing to measure in terms of costs, if somebody is alive or dead, there's no question in, in measuring it. You can't hide the statistic in any way. And so here we are. We know that air pollution at the at a conservative estimate is responsible for 8.8 .8 million premature death globally. In the UK, again, this is a conservative estimate, it's 36,000 deaths per year, or 5% of our death. 
And in our region, in West Midlands, and I suppose Warwickshire is part, being near enough, it's about 5%. London is the worst at about 6.5%. But how do we get here? Where does this pollution come from? You, this is a busy slide, and I, and, and, and I apologize for it at the beginning, but the aim of it is really to show you the sources and what you need to uh, probably pay attention the most is the, the, the data that is presented in yellow or orange. For example, you can see that most of our pollution comes from energy industries, manufacturing and construction, industrial processes, residential and small scale commercial combustion, non-road transport, road transport, and finally agriculture. And our prime minister is saying he's going to get us out of trouble with COVID, build, build, and build. So here we are, less pollution is going to go up, dry, and calm down. Every one of these produces pollution, but obviously they contribute different, uh, different quantities of each pollution. For example, sulfur dioxide, is mostly from manufacturing industries and residential small scale combustion. Residential and a small, small, a small scale commercial combustion produces the highest proportion of our particulate matter 2.5, which is followed by industrial processes and road transport. More than half of our non-methane uh, volatile organic compounds comes from industrial processes and their failure to manage their apparatus well by creating fugitive emissions. Road transport and non-road transport and energy production are responsible for the majority of our nitrogen oxide pollution. Lastly, we have ammonia, which is mainly the product of our agricultural practices and meat production in particular, which for Warwickshire being uh, a, a very green county is particularly important. But well, coming back to what I was asked to, uh, uh, to talk about, how does it affect our health? I think uh, uh, Razor mentioned some of it at the beginning. Most people think, oh, it's bad air. It's going to affect my lungs. But that's not true. It actually, apart from your lungs, affects the eyes. It causes conjunctivitis. There's evidence it causes glaucoma. There's evidence it causes corneal opacity. It causes rhinitis, causes throat inflammation, increased infection. Even ear infections are increased by, by air pollution. Then it gets into our, uh, our, our circulation and it goes to our heart. And all of you know about that it causes increased cardiac disease in terms of angina, heart attacks, and eventually heart failure. It affects our blood vessels, and blood vessels are going everywhere. So it affects the main blood vessels in the body, causing atherosclerosis, which is ulceration in the walls of our blood vessels, leading to aneurysms, peripheral vascular disease, amputations, leg ulcers. It goes to the brain, and it causes narrowing of the arteries of the brain, causing strokes. Uh, it affects the reproductive system. Maybe that is why the Western countries are having a lower number of children because uh, we are poisoning everybody. And at the same time, we are poisoning the unborn babies. And again, as Razor has mentioned, there is very good evidence that when the pollution is peaking, hospital admissions for related conditions increase as well. And I, meant, I, I didn't use my, my, my line of known unknowns and unknown unknowns, but I'm sure you do know that our knowledge is still not there. So what about diabetes and obesity? As I'm sure most of you know, these are the new scourges of the, uh, of the Western society. We are going to be seriously affected by it in the NHS. Human studies and animal studies clearly show that increased air pollution causes increased blood glucose levels. And that means type 1 diabetes, insulin dependent, type 2 diabetes, adult onset, insulin resistant, gestational diabetes, i.e. we are causing pregnancy issues, and sadly also higher fat deposition and higher body weight, uh, which are major issues for the NHS to deal with at the moment. Now, I don't want to, to complicate things, but for those of you who want the science, this is how it damages our brain. So it comes in through our lungs, if it's small enough, it gets into our circulation. Then we have this barrier called blood-brain barrier, which God put in there to protect us against our brain being affected by toxins, bacteria, and viruses. Unfortunately, these darn things cross it. And also, if it comes through your nose, the roof of your nose is next to the base of your brain, and they get into the brain area. 
And you can see by, the, by a series of mechanisms, which doesn't really matter, but essentially they cause severe inflammation around the neurons. And that means that the cells, the, neuron, the neurons in the brain die, which means early dementia, which means uh, loss of cognitive ability. What about the impact across life? It's like we just talked about the brain, but I'm sure again, you know that its effect is in pregnancy. So we create low birth weight children. Now there is evidence, low birth weight children will have lower intelligence. They are going to be uh, uh, achieving less. They, their lungs do not develop, so they'll have poorer life quality. They, they, they have issues with behavior. So this is going to be banking problems for a, for a long period of time. Children themselves get asthma. Although everybody thinks we are born with lungs that are functioning, they're actually not yet developed. Up to about eight years of age, our lungs continue to develop. And so these children's lungs do not develop. Then they have developmental problems, more wheezing and coughs, more chest infection, missing schooling. Then we get the start of the atherosclerosis, which as I mentioned is the alteration that leads to heart attacks, strokes, uh, uh, and all sorts of other issues much earlier than we used to see. This is, this is uh, really becoming a major issue. In adults, is coronary heart disease, strokes, now the exposure is beginning to see cancer. I think Razor mentioned at the beginning that two of his neighbors, unfortunately, have the of lung cancer. We are beginning to see a higher, higher incidence of lung cancer. If you stop smoking, now we are causing lung cancer by air pollution. Then the diabetes that I, I mentioned. And as we get older, the main one becomes dementia and strokes and, uh, and heart attacks. So what are these, uh, these things that are poisoning us? I'm sure some of it has been mentioned. We are only really measuring 2.5. We don't even measure 10 or 0.1. The smaller they are, the more they penetrate. 10 is coarse, 2.5 is, is fine, and 0.1 is ultra fine. And the smaller the particles, as I said, the, the deeper they go. Now, in this slide, you can see in, 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 in red, that's the number of diseases that a particular matter 2.5 for which there is information. The other ones, we don't even have enough information to start producing anything. That, that in 2017, that's the number of cases of disease they cause. But as you know, we are going to be alive for a long time. They're exposing these children. So if you look over an 18 year period, you can see that over 1.3 million new cases of disease are attributed to particular 2.5. And there is strong evidence that every time we increase it by five microgram, we increase our mortality by 7%. So what about nitrogen dioxide uh, or uh, all the oxides of nitrogen? First of all, this is a potent greenhouse gas, and we've been going on about climate change uh, in, 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 our, in our meetings. Again, the slide is in the same format. The orange showing the current uh, 2017 data, and the blue showing the accumulative uh, uh, effect over a number of years. And the important thing here is look at diabetes and its association with nitrous oxide. And we can see that over an 18 year period is going to cause us over a million new cases of disease because of nitrous oxide. So these are, these are huge numbers. What about ammonia? Most of this comes from our agriculture. And again, all of those of you who are meat eaters, this is you, because a lot of the nitrogen comes from the animals we keep to produce meat and the ammonia gets into the air, disperses, and because particular matter, it also then reacts and produces even more nitrous oxide, which as you remember from the previous slide, is a potent uh, uh, cause of air pollution in its own right. And this is the only one we seem to measure, uh, at least in Coventry anyway. Sulfur dioxide is a strong irritant to the lining of the respiratory system. High levels lead to cough, Parts of the chest, narrowing of airways, it initiates and exacerbates asthma attacks. Fortunately, there is a lesson. If we change behavior, levels do fall. Because we are burning less coal, it's been decreasing by 66%. And it will decrease more, hopefully, if we aim towards renewable energy. What about this non-methane volatile organic 
organic compounds. I'm sorry, this is a bit of a mouthful, but methane, you know, is a different thing and it's measured differently. These are things such as benzene, butane. They, they, they react with sunlight uh, and heat to produce ozone. Uh, this is ground ozone. There are two types of ozone that I'm sure you do know. We have atmospheric ozone, which is good ozone. It protects us. And then we have ground ozone that poisons us. It's particularly high during sunny days, exactly the time that we go out to get some fresh air. So the more sun it is, the more it produces ozone, the more we get poisoned. And it can also be transported long distance by wind. So even rural areas do not escape. They also sadly form secondary organic aerosols, which are in their own right, mutagenic and carcinogenic. Ozone, this is how ozone affects you. If, if you want to know the mechanism, it causes the muscles of the airways to constrict trapping air in the alveoli, which means the lungs cannot change air. This leads to wheezing. It's an amazing uh, uh, builder and maker. He designed our airways to have a special cells in them. These cells have cilia, which are hair-like things on the surface of them that trap any pollution. And then they, they, and the way they beat, they beat up towards our mouth and nose. So they push it back up. And so we cough it out. Unfortunately, ozone and all the other air pollutions damage the cells by causing inflammation. This means the cilia are lost. This means the system cannot trap them, which means it goes into the lungs and then through the alveolar capillary system, it gets into our, our circulation. So I'm coming to an end nearly enough. Uh, uh, this is a call for help from, uh, from, from me as a doctor. Uh, over the next 18 years, if you were ambitious, and I see our politicians say they are ambitious, and our local politicians are a lot more ambitious than our national, national politicians, and thank God for that. Um, if we reduced our fine particulate by one microgram per meter square, just that, that's not a lot, just one microgram, we reduce the incidence of coronary heart disease by over 50,000, nearly 60,000. We reduced the number of strokes by 16 and a half thousand. 9,300 cases of asthma, 4,200 lung cancers. Now, the way I see this meeting, if, the, if our politicians in Warwickshire and Coventry and West Midlands get together, and if you go for 10, we will reduce the increase the life span in UK by five times more than eliminating all casualties on the road. So here we go, traffic calming, doing this, speed cameras, that, that, that. Look, reduce air pollution, and you're going to be a lot more effective in reducing mortality. COVID has been mentioned. I'm sure you've heard it. There is a picture. You can see what it has done to air. That's the same place being looked at before COVID, and after COVID. So this little blue planet of ours is able to repair itself. We just have to stop poisoning it. Thank you very much for listening. Dr. Kashi, thank you very much for a very enlightening presentation. We needed a doctor. 30 years ago, I used to work with French doctors. They were long, especially people like yourselves. I was an engineer, polluting the air through my engine designs and so on. And then they, they, they came up with this concept of PM10, PM2.5 and so on, precisely for the reason that you were explaining. But that was 30 years ago, we didn't take notice. And I remember I helped, mm -hmm. uh, I advised the government to go for hybrid cars at the time was a possible in, in short to medium term solutions. Uh, I won a lot of prizes. I was invited to House of Lords. I was given a national diploma. <laughs> but my designs were forgotten over a few months. So it's not just a politician. It's us. We have to all come together because politicians come and go. But we can use them as a part of the community to take that message to, to the higher levels and then link the councils with the national governments and try to see how we can influence their decisions. And the whole purpose is to come up with better ideas. Anyway, we, it's a lunch time, but is there any burning question for Dr. Kashi before we go a break for lunch for half an hour? 
I just like to say that this is, I know that we got, uh, I don't know if John Seddon is still here and listening on behalf of Coventry. I know the mayor couldn't be here. Um, I live at the edge of the, the, the Solihull, Coventry and, and Warwickshire. And Mel was saying something about opacity. And I look at plans for at Warwickshire websites and Coventry website. Coventry is very opaque. He is correct. Warwickshire, thank God, is a lot more open. And when I ask Coventry, why are you so opaque? They tell me it's for legal reasons. And when I say, well, the same legal things must affect Warwickshire. How does it only affect Coventry? There is no answer. So Coventry does remain very opaque. And, I, and, I, and, and Mel is right. It's very difficult to get any information out of them. We are hoping now to have these channels with John and his colleagues and others. And we are having a few of these uh, teleconferencing meetings, so hopefully, um, because also I realize that uh, the challenges are different. They're under uh, different type of pressures. But my only hope is that we will um, help them to ask for more because 24 million is not enough for, the, yeah. for trying to help to improve the air quality. Okay, Matty, you wanted to say something. Yeah, Please. just the, first of all, thank you, Dr. Habib. That was a really great presentation. And I second that. Uh, I have had, as a councillor in Coventry, quite a few people find that it's easier to communicate with Warwick District Council and they respond back quickly, especially related to planning issues. Um, so that's definitely, I, I second that. Um, I want to just say something about Professor Reza. I know funding is crucial, but I don't think it's just everything about funding, funding, funding. You could have funding, but actually not use it in the right way. Um, let's use what we have now. And one of the key things is if people don't change their awareness and attitude and their behavior, it doesn't matter how much funding you pump into it, it will never have that impact. Are we saying that if we, let's, put a scenario that all the cars turn to uh, batteries, would that be the solution? What will happen in the next 50 years time when we want to get rid of these cars? Then we have another problem. So I think that there's different layers that we need to be aware. And you, you are right, politicians are a way to communicate the messages, but it's individuals and citizens are the ones who are living and you know we are all individuals and citizens and have responsibility and and so therefore we need to take these actions but what we can do uh, is try to pass the message and make it louder and make this awareness i mean what the presentation of dr habi was um you know very clearly the impact it has on health i don't think that's been put out there for the normal every public person not knowing that even myself I could say that I don't know the statistic and I probably would like Mr. Dr. Habi to share his presentation if he could. Um, my question was related to his last slide uh, which was quite interesting that figure how did that come about with the numbers of reduction of the cases in 18 next 18 years that's the question I have. It's all the statistics from Public Health England and World Health Organization. It's their projection for, of, 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 of uh, the numbers. Um, right. So I haven't done the statistics. I assume for it to be in public domain, yeah. they, must, they must have fact-checked it. It's yeah. not President Trump, uh, fortunately. They do, they do fact-check before they put it out there. Thank you very much. Thank you. The reason why, Dr. Professor, just going back to the finance, is that it's easy not to action something because we say we don't have the finance. But I think it comes together, having the finance, but it's still working together with the communities. You know, walking doesn't need finance. Um, you know, I've been to, you know, abroad, and rain doesn't stop people to walk in Spain. You know, people embrace different kinds of weathers. But when I'm in UK, the first thing happens when I see it rain, oh God, you know, life stops and then you can't do anything. You can't cycle, you can't, you know, it's that attitude that needs to be changed too. And I think that we need to look at multi-levels on this. And that's why people like Adam Tranter, a role is really crucial in highlighting the important issues of that other politicians don't do. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, yeah, well said, well said, Matty. Thank you for saying it. 
By the way, Adam is going to talk to us after lunch, so hopefully everybody will, could come back. When I was talking about funding was that the, the amount is given for the, amount, the problem that we have before us is not enough. Uh, I personally, uh, uh, my colleagues at the chamber, they know, uh, my own little organization is funding everything <laughs> at the moment, but I'm getting old. So um, I am asking for a small amount of money somehow to come to get a young man to do so, so uh, some of the measurement we were doing, some of the reports reading, some of the things we were organizing. And we are not talking about a lot of money. We were talking about 200,000 over three years and getting a young man and a young person to, so this sort of thing I was saying. And hopefully by talking to the councils, maybe that money will come in. If not, we carry on as we are. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree totally, I agree. Sorry, just one last thing. Government did give Coventry City Council 340,000 to spend on an emergency measure for cycling, but they haven't spent it and it'd be kind of, you know, time has pa passed by and we had the opportunity to do that and the lockdown to create pop-up cycles. So mm -hmm. that's what I mean. It's not necessarily just sometimes funding. It's, it's working together collectively. I, I, I couldn't agree more and I, I will, I know everyone wants to go for lunch. I'll say this. Sorry about the that. Money, the money is there. For example, if you can spend 28 million pounds on improving a roundabout, improving, to help the traffic flow, but you've only got four million pounds to put towards a cycleway that will take an awful lot of traffic off that roundabout, the, tra that the money is just in the wrong pot, and that's political will. The money is just being spent on old fashioned things by old fashioned planners. Mm -hmm. That's a personal beef, but anyway, happy lunch times. Happy, okay, then we go for lunch. We'll come back in half an hour. So please look at your watches or your iPhones. Time it now, it's 20 past one. We will be here at 10 to two to continue with the program. Thank you very much, everyone. See you later on. Thank you.